Okay. Well, um, I guess I can be blamed for creating all this trouble here, but uh, I'm, I'm excited uh, to finally get our first workshop and uh, to, to meet all to, to, to discuss it. Um, my, my background is uh, I'm a, a serial entrepreneur, I guess, uh, in, in commercial uh, um, businesses and, and then turned into a social entrepreneur and uh, started uh, Human Energy a couple of years ago. Um, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm really excited that we're making all this progress. Great, and, and do you wanna just give a, a general background on what brought you to human energy specifically, just uh, so that people get the motivational factor behind it? Sure, um, um, probably most of you may, may have heard that my, my story, but I've, I've, I'll, I'll try to, to make it brief. Um, and I, I was born in, in Mosul, Iraq, uh, of, of all places. Uh, to a, a um, Catholic uh, family, and and so I was I was brought up in a, uh, as a um, I guess uh, um, very close to the to uh, the Jesuit um, I guess tradition of teaching. Uh, my dad was was taught by the Jesuits in France, and I I was sent uh, from a very early age to a boarding boarding school in Baghdad uh, that was started by the American uh, Jesuits and and uh, I, I was really very lucky to get that education and then went on to a Jesuit university that was also in Baghdad, Iraq and and uh, I was studying engineering physics in my in my sophomore year uh, I I had a crisis I, I guess uh, I I was leaning uh, well most most young people in Iraq at that time were were leaning socialists and, and communists. And, and I was very influenced by all these thoughts as, as well as influenced by science and st started questioning uh, my, my uh, I guess, uh, Catholic uh, beliefs. And, and there was a huge struggle inside. And uh, in, in, it was an existential, existential uh, I guess, problem. Um, I, I decided finally to go talk to my uh, very favorite uh, uh, Jesuit uh, professor, uh, Father John Banks. Uh, long story short, uh, after I told him my story, um, he said, Ben, have you, have you heard of Théa de Chardin? I said, no. Well, okay, go pick up his book, The Phenomenon of Man, read it, and then come back and we'll talk. And that was the, the rest of my life. I've been uh, reading Théard all these years. Most of my, I've pretty much read most of his works. Uh, but what appealed to me the most was his scientific work. Um, his, his other spiritual works were very appealing, but science was really my, my love. And, and in any case, um, as, as I um, started having children and now grandchildren, uh, I could see that they, they are going into through, going through what I went through, but, but even, even more intense now. And, and Barbara, my, my wife and I, who had started a foundation about 20 years ago, a small foundation to do good, uh, decided that uh, uh, part of our mission should be to disseminate Teilhard's uh, thought um, as, it, as it relates to uh, the noosphere and, and, and to use it to help, um, I guess, to, to, to help ignite, uh, ignite this, this thing that is happening, to, to ignite it, meaning to bring it up to people's attention that there's something wonderful happening. The human race is, is, is coming together collectively uh, to, a, to, a, I, I, to a omega point or a star in, 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 the, in the future that whereby we as, as human beings can, can produce the can bring up the, the best in us to uh, help create uh, and, and develop flourishing for all human race in love and, and, and compassion and to avoid all the pitfalls of um, what was ha what has happened is happening now and what has happened in the past. So that, that maybe in a nutshell is 
his background, etc. Thank you, Ben, and and thank you for sharing that again because I do think this adds to the 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 context of of how this can potentially be useful and maybe some of a meta frame. I would call it for for some of the other work that we're doing because we have some eclectic disciplines connected here and we may be thinking about adding a number of of, of disciplines in a way to to figure out how can this all connect and i i would sort of suggest that the frame is something that david uh wilson worked on quite a bit in terms of bringing science and and religion religious narratives together in, in a certain way and i think tailhart is also your sort of one of your references, David, do you want to just share and go next in terms of how you relate to this work and, and what you see can, sure. the, can the impact be? Sure, I started working with Ben, I guess uh, two years ago, Ben, when, when I was invited to the workshop that, um, and Terry Deacon is one of my close associates. So um, that's how I entered Ben's world. And, and uh, I introduced myself as uh, the modern incarnation of Tehard, which, uh, which uh, was the best thing I possibly could have said to Ben Cacera. Um, <laughs> and um, but by that, I mean that uh, I'm an evolutionary scientist like Tehard, and I'm very interested in, in, in religion and, and so on. And so to keep it short, I have my own organization, Pro Social World. Um, uh, my first organization was the Evolution Institute. Pro Social World is uh, is um, our new spinoff, which is very, very highly aligned with the mission of the of the Human Energy uh, Project, and that's why I find it very easy to work with Ben and to get involved in in your projects, Ben. And and when we're starting with kind of the science end of things, so the current project is to put Tehard on a modern scientific foundation. I'm doing that with Alan Honick. And, uh, but we're eager to expand into the educational sector, which is what this previously formed group is about. And also what Ben, you call the ethics part of the Human Energy Project, which is really to implement some of these ideas in the real world, real world settings. And Pro Social World has its own educational arm, Pro Social Schools. Uh, we're forming a youth corps, Pro Social Youth Corps. Uh, and so uh, we have quite a bit, I think, that we're eager to, to um, integrate in terms of on, on the educational uh, front uh, with uh, the fine work that, uh, that has been taking place uh, before I became involved. And so, uh, so I'm um, I enjoyed reviewing the material that we'll be discussing today. Um, I have my own relationship with Michael um, in the business school curriculum, and and so on. So quite a lot going on with Michael apart from the Human Energy uh, Project. All kinds of intersecting lines, basically, which is exactly what we need in order to um, to uh, form that noosphere that we keep that we keep talking about. So uh, very happy to be here, uh, primarily in learning mode for this workshop because I've been uh, um, reviewing the material. And, and so uh, I look forward to, to, um, to being um, um, a learner uh, for much of this workshop. And shall I tap the next person? Let me uh, tap Ian as the next person if you... Uh, Hi everyone, uh, I'm Ian McDonald. I'm uh, a researcher at ProSocial World and a postdoctoral scholar at Binghamton University. My background um, is kind of in the realm of cultural evolutionary science uh, as it relates to humans. And I'm particularly interested in the, the way values and shared values um, kind of shape the way uh, we construct our daily lives in the, in the world together. And in that capacity, I've kind of studied religion and spirituality um, with David, um, intentional communities. And at my time at Binghamton, I've also been an instructor in the evolutionary studies program. And then most recently, I've been working with Michael and his colleagues at Fordham doing the intervention of the pro-social process within their um, sophomore team project. Um, so I'm kind of, I'm new to, um, the topic we're talking on today, but um, I think I've got enough kind of background. To, I'm looking forward to learning more and seeing how I can contribute. 
So I'll pass it to Devin. Devin, you're muted. Hey everyone. Um, my name is Devin. I work with uh, Human Energy as the director of media production. I'm directing the story of the Noosphere series with Brian Swim. And I've been working in, <clears throat> in this space for the last four years with Journey of the Universe uh, with Mary Evelyn Tucker and Brian as the project manager on that side and also doing media production there as well. And, and where I come into all this is I'm very interested in time, de time developmental cosmology, the big picture, uh, the story and evolution of the universe and how that provides context for our present moment uh, and this current uh, epoch or emergence that we're in with the noosphere. And where I come in just uh, from a level of passion is, you know, I, I go around the world and I see people that are looking for for context, for insight, for inspiration uh, in a world that doesn't really have a complete picture or a, a thorough or coherent story to offer. And I see that in this tradition that goes all the way back to Teilhard and, and beyond. And I think that there's a lot to offer um, and some really beautiful ways to represent these ideas uh, using modern technology. Um, and you can see that in the, the series that we've made so far and a, a lot of the media productions that we're up to with Human Energy. And Devin, can I just ask you to also uh, share a little bit the background on how you reached out to Brian and the other groups and, and why? I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. In the so course, I, we, I, we did touch on that, but uh, just, just share a little bit. Why are you interested, sort of coming from a younger generation? <laughs> yeah, so I um, had 10 years of background in entrepreneurship, business, focused on marketing and media production. Did that across a couple of different industries, apparel, wellness. Um, basically, you know, goods that you can sell, commodities of that sort. And I just got burned out on that. I learned that there's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of magic, a lot of power, a lot of good that can happen through uh, business and, and in my case through media marketing, really interfacing with your market, your customer, uh, for us in this case, our student, and really using marketing and media tactics to, to think of the audience and to think of the, the customer for, or the student first and what is their perspective and what did they need and feeling that connection of when you're responding to their needs and, and feeling the rubber hit the road and in business that means sales <clears throat> and you can feel that success and it's, it's exciting and it's inspiring and you know it only goes so far and so for me it went about eight or nine years to where I got burnt out on it. And I said, I don't, I don't really want to put more things into the world. I want to amplify ideas. And so while I was living in Austin, Texas, I, uh, like a good millennial, used the internet to find Brian's email address and essentially peppered him with questions and ideas until he said, okay, I'll talk to you. And then eventually I flew out to San Francisco and we talked more. Um, and then over the course of some years, we continued to develop what could be possible working together and uh, over time, he introduced me to Mary Evelyn and we found a role for me there to where I could reposition myself full time in this educational space. Uh, so yeah, it comes from a real need of, of wanting to use my skills for good. Um, and what's very interesting is the more that I work on larger media productions in this space and I work with cinematographers, editors, audio engineers, marketers, all from the business background from my generation, they all say the same thing. They're so ready to use these skills that they have for good, for amplifying ideas that are meaningful and using them to orient uh, our offerings to the audience in a way that really lands as purposeful in their life. Um, and so there's a real zest for uh, making this work happen, um, both for me and, and the other people that I work with. Thank you for sharing, Devin. And this, this added something new to me also hearing that it's and it's fantastic. And I, I do think it's important to keep that in mind because I think you may be mo more or you and Ian may be the closest to our cheap audience. <laughs> sure. And and just sort of figuring out how can we create that space where where people can be in, in that in that inquiry. And so thank you. Certainly. Um, we have a popcorn too. Ben. You're the most mysterious to me, so I can't wait to meet you. We have two Bens, so I... Oh, Ben. Yeah. Well, t -t I suppose that's me, Devin. Yes. Yeah. 
uh, well, I'll solve, I'll, I'll solve the mystery a little bit because I've been admiring your guitar and drums. I play guitar and drums as well. Uh, so uh, <laughs> uh, I, I'm right here in Manila, the Philippines, and it's my pleasure to join this group. I, I'm assuming the question is how, how do we relate to the, the topic of uh, El Hard de Chardon and the new sphere? And, and, my, and my, just a little bit of a background of, of your work and how you come. Yes. This. All right. So uh, thank you, Michael. My main work is uh, in organizational ethics and corporate governance. So I'm, I'm very interested in how corporations can be more active as agents for human flourishing rather than predominantly the agents of human exploitation that they are in, in my country at least. And uh, part of what helps in that work is uh, interdisciplinary work. That's why this is an exciting feature of what we're doing here and focus on spirituality and also tying it up with science. So a lot of the materials in the pilot course uh, resonated with me because I also teach philosophy of science and I've always been intrigued by how science can actually be an agent for human flourishing instead of the objectification that it usually leads to. And uh, since I'm a sociologist by background, I'm really interested in institutions and how values and communities uh, can help humans flourish and how we can rebuild our institutions so that they can, they can lead us to, towards where we want to be rather than just uh, being swept by changes in globalization and technology. So the, the appeal to me here is uh, what can be our proactive approach to the challenges that we face now, given uh, what was mentioned in the course about the technological dilemma, and how can we have more control and agency? So in our MBA program, we have action research as the way we do this. We, we encourage our students to think of themselves as change agents and not as passive uh, recipients of you know, consumption goods and all of this. So that's why, that, that is why when I was looking at the purpose for this program, a lot of it resonated with me and I really look forward to, to learning with you guys and helping improve this, these materials for our students. So am I supposed to pass on to someone? Uh, I'm not sure who has spoken. Kimberly, have you had a turn? No, I haven't. Thank you. I ben. choose you then, yes. <laughs> Thanks. Um, my name is Kimberly Lamarck Orman, and I'm a professor at Fordham University in the Gabelli School of Business. I teach communication courses. And um, over the past year and a half or so, um, Michael Pearson and I have been working on a project that is entitled Dignity Road that um, focuses on um, the humanistic management and using creative and artistic um, tools of puppets and characters to create videos that introduce um, the humanistic management. And I see a great alignment between um, the human energy project and humanistic management. And so we had been talking for a while about bringing that together. Um, in addition, um, I've been looking at how the Human Energy Project also connects with communication courses that I teach. I see communication as science and an art form, particularly in presentation. And so I, um, as I was reviewing the material, uh, I've been seeing the connection between the, the human energy and presentation and connecting with other people because I think a lot of times when people present, they're almost outside of their own body and not really connected. Um, I'm fascinated with the idea of a global mindset and um, a third level uh, and seeing that as a parallel with zeitgeist in terms of where we are as a society. And so I'm very excited to um, be a part of today and to see how um, we can further incorporate the human energy project into the work that we're doing. Thank you, Kimberly. And you wanna pop it over to, I think? 
Um, Cody. let's see. Cody, I think is our last person. Yes, Jacody. Jyoti. So it's pronounced Jyoti. Jyoti. Thank you. It's Sanskrit for flame or light. And um, I grew up in India. I live in the Bay Area since 1986. I'm a professor at St. Mary's College of California. That's the campus in the background. Ellen is a colleague of mine who I have um, run into more often on the Zoom screen than I ever did in the corridors <laughs> of the campus. Um, so that's the global mind and the global connections that are developing. Um, I'm in the business school. I teach strategy, management of technology and innovation. I've been part of the humanistic management group with Michael Pearson for about a decade. I have um, been the co-founder of the US chapter and the India chapter because what Michael does is the only place where I feel enough things connect for me to show up as fully human. I can do science, art, strategy, organizational behavior, practice relevant work, and have fun in the process of doing it too. So thank you, Michael, for doing what you've been doing. Um, ben and I are together at this organiz other organization within the Academy of Management called the MSR. I don't know if I can show this. Okay, if I move the camera. Uh, which, like the Humanistic Management Network, within the Academy of Management, there's an interest group called Management, Spirituality, and Religion. And that's the other home. Michael was the president last year. I uh, serve on the executive board along with Ben. And they found me through the workshops I run at the Academy of Management. And in the past five years, my journey has been to use the arts to humanize management. Although I'm a Stanford trained engineer with a physics major for my undergrad, um, arts has been a part of my life as a private practice for a long time, something you do for fun. Um, I'm part of the South Bay Improv group here in Silicon Valley and have been for 15 years and I've read poetry all my life. But now I get to bring it to workshops at the Academy of Management and the Humanistic Management Conferences and I'm being arm twisted into writing about it which is really, really scary for me uh, because I'd rather practice it. And in that spirit of making things practice oriented, I'm going to read you a poem by Ogden Nash. Reflections on ingenuity. Here's a good rule of thumb. Too clever is dumb. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. So thank you, Jody, for joining. And thank you, Ben, for coming. I think it's nine o'clock at night in your place, right? Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, David. And thank you, Ian, um, for making this effort. I, I just wanted to share a little bit of my background. Some of you know, <laughs> but I, I have a number of, of books of David. <laughs> I just put them, a couple that I found. Here's the one, the, the Darwin's Cathedral. Um, and, and I guess my, my shelf over there is carrying a lot of Wilson books, E.O. Wilson and, and David, and, and the number of other Wilsons seem to be sort of the ticket to evolutionary biology or something. Uh, but that work has fascinated me in the journey of, that I'm on in terms of like, how can we organize better? And, uh, that is sort of what has guided me and the confluence, the consilience of knowledge is a little bit the, the thing that I think, at, well, that's what's for me holds it together. Jyoti was talking about bringing the arts, the science together. I think we're talking about bringing faith and science together as well. And what is the narrative? What is the uh, underlying question is like, who are we as human beings and where are we going? And those fundamental existential questions, I think, are something that that brought David and me together in the bigger scheme of things. And then, David, you introduced me to Ben. So this is how we're sort of weaving the threads of the various conversations here in the noosphere. 
I believe. And so I just wanted to bring that to to uh, your attention. Here's a book that I wrote uh, on humanistic management, which is sometimes getting sort of like, oh, okay, humanism. Um, well, it's sort of an attempt, it's a label to bring together what do we know is allowing us to access human energy in a positive way. And what does it mean from a normative perspective, <laughs> uh, sort of across religious, cross spiritual narratives that have been a long lasting and, and the concept of dignity is, is that I think, which, which is oftentimes labeled as that which we know people aspire to. And human energy is very low if we don't feel we are honored in our dignity. And that's sort of the, the the precursor to then the flourishing piece. And that to me then becomes an organizationally oriented um, imperative. And I think that's where also strategy, marketing, all of the other business disciplines, organizational disciplines connect, but they cannot connect well without the legitimacy of the, the sort of scientific narrative. And in the scheme of things, David, we talked about this in other contexts, we have, might have talked about this here, but I think this may be important where um, the work that um, Teilhard de Chardin was working on is that the, the notion of who are we as people is critical. And that has been currently, I think one of the biggest, well, is, is one of the biggest gaps. The business school gains its legitimacy from economics. Economics gains its legitimacy from a set of assumptions, not reality, not evidence, not science, which is kind of absurd. Uh, but yes, the notion of homo economicus is sort of the guiding notion, even though in many ways people are not aware. Um, and that is what informs much of organizational theory, much of management. And I think that's maybe also the reason why we are in such trouble as a species because those people <laughs> that get trained in that way uh, have access to power business is one of the most powerful uh, most popular degrees if it's not the most the, the most popular after engineering or something like that so whatever we teach there i think is is making a difference and to for the worse right now and i think we can shift it for the better so that's why i i'm excited about this and thank you ben for, for sort of generating that space also and that's, I think, why we're starting in this conversation. We could probably have invited a thousand people that are aligned with this, but we're trying to do this within the smaller group with enough divergence and diversity, but also with a common thread and a shared sort of um, intention just to figure out how can we sort of use that and explore that um, so that once we are done with this, <laughs> we can scale it up. Because I think there is an urgency behind, at least that's what I see. There's an urgency and, and, and a need and an opportunity to really help and uh, uh, shift what I see is, is sort of a missing. And I'll just throw this out there um, uh, for a conversation starter, maybe also just to have people react to what they saw on the in the course, what was sort of resonating, what did not resonate. Uh, what what questions do you have? And, and we have Ellen and Devin here and, and Ben also, and, and I think David and, and most of us, we can sort of figure out how, how we can at least approach um, some of those questions uh, with more clarity and just maybe note them. So I'll be taking notes here mostly um, and then uh, just listen, okay? So anyone want to chime in, please feel free to do so. We're a small enough group. I think we can self-organize. <laughs> we use the CDPs. Uh, <laughs> and maybe David and, and Ian, you can you can guide us and come in when, when we're violating them. So anybody? I'll wanna... start the, mm -hmm. with the comment for Devin. Thank you in your introduction about um, what moves you, what you are doing, and in pursuing the material, um, the quality of production blew me away. So since you admitted to being the person behind that, thank you for what you've done. Um, because coming from academia, we don't have those resources, often rely on our students to help with projects to make things media friendly. And this production quality is uh, not just head and shoulders, but orders of magnitude ahead of what can be produced in academia. So thank you for that. 
And uh, Ben K, since you said you're the one causing all this trouble, thank you for causing the trouble. And Jyoti, do you want to just share a little bit of your reaction to the content that was presented? Like what opened up for you uh, listening to what what the, the course uh, was was uh, generating? Um, I've my intention this morning in engaging is curiosity. So if you will permit me, I will sit with my curiosity and hear others first before I share my reaction. Because Michael, as you know, I always have very strong reactions to things and I don't want to cloud the discussion with my strong reactions right up front, but I will um, hold my curiosity for a while before I share mine. All right. Mike, Michael, I have something that might add to, uh, and Jody, that might add to the curiosity to stir the, the pot a bit and, and Thank you for the kind words. It means a lot that it landed and connected with you. Um, what's available now through technology is like no other era before in terms of education and, and wanting to communicate a message. And so as we're reviewing these materials and think about thinking about how we can communicate these ideas in this paradigm to a larger community, I, I encourage everyone here to think um, widely with their imagination in terms of what's possible in terms of media production and um, just using technology to articulate what we're up to. And the way that I look at each one of those videos, in my mind, I, I call them, they're either seeds or I call them digital cathedrals, spaces that people can enter into to have a transformative experience with respect to the ingredients that we're working with. And we can make a lot of different spaces. And, and Ellen and I have started thinking about this and, and, and Michael on the on supplemental videos for this course that are of the same character and quality of what you've seen on our uh, human energy channel so far, but a little bit more bespoke for um, a student uh, for these particular courses. And um, so there's a lot of potential and there's a lot of people like me that have highly developed editing media production skills that are ready to uh, sink their teeth into something juicy like this. And so as we're thinking about what's working and what's not working, know that we can always make more and we can, and that's part of the process and the intention of the YouTube channel. It's a place to have little trial balloons, experiments of what works here, what, what stood out. Um, and we can do that in qualitative ways by just experiencing it and having conversations like this we also are supported by heavy duty analytics from YouTube that say exactly how this landed, with who, for how long, and all of that. So we're really entering a very highly resourced and intelligent space uh, in the YouTube forum. I can ask a related question if that's okay. Um, Devin, as you were producing it, um, was there a specific audience you had in mind as you were producing it? And what is, I love the metaphor of digital cathedrals. I love the idea of creating spaces where people can show up as, um, and feel included and feel they belong and can feel that they are accepted as fully human. But I'm just curious because often, when content is created, there is at least notionally a target audience. So did you have a target audience in mind? Certainly, yeah. And I have pages of uh, market research and, and strategy that I can share afterwards uh, that really you know, outlines what our approach was for that. But we're, we're very much centered on the youth uh, in the terms of you know, millennials and Gen Zs as people that are forming their careers and plotting their course in life and looking for some sort of North Star um, by which to organize their life. So, so from a uh, demographic perspective, that's a big one. Um, but also not everyone, even in those groups, is particularly sensitive or ready um, in their personal development for these ideas. We're working with pretty big, um, powerful ideas. And so it takes something in your life to open you up to a new paradigm. And so because of that, another demographic that we work with is people that self-identify as sensitive to, I'm gonna say cosmology and using the word cosmology in the sense of paradigms of meaning and purpose that are, are, are sent, that have 
they're looking for things that communicate meaning and purpose on YouTube and across the internet. And people self-identify them, them, uh, themselves through what they search, what they watch, the groups that they engage with. And so that data already exists. We don't need to reinvent the wheel there. There are um, a subsection of people within those larger demographic audience groups that have already um, told themselves and told the internet and told YouTube that they are seeking. And so we are looking to respond to those that are seeking. And one of the tones of the YouTube series is, is to respond to those that have a sense, they have a feeling. And sometimes, you know, that's at a spiritual level or an emotional level or psychological level. They don't fully comprehend what they're seeking. I don't know if you ever will. Um, we're all, you know, searching for, for more context and understanding about our purpose and place here. Um, and so we wanted to respond to that at both a scientifically grounded level, but one that is also emotionally, and, and that comes through in the film space, is cinematically inspirited. There's, there's a movement to it. So there's the cuts are a little bit tighter. Music it has a little bit more of a presence than it would in a traditional educational video. And with that, we're trying to respond to those which are sensing the need for something. They, they have a yearning. Um, and so that those are some of the big uh, X and Y and Z axes of, of the type of audience that we're looking for. And um, you know, one final layer that I'll put on that is <clears throat> there's a really beautiful chart of, called the arc of diffusion of innovative ideas. I don't know if um, I'll, I'll put an image of it in the chat, but <clears throat> it talks about how ideas are spread throughout society. And the first section of that is early adopters. And then it's, um, uh, no, there's the, yeah, the early adopters are the first people in that group. And so what we're looking for is who are the early adopters of new ideas across the internet? And they are, even if they're not in the space of meaning and purpose, but they're the type of person that's going to try out new things. That's another audience qualifying factor that um, has informed as we're doing advertisements, small little 30 second spots on YouTube or Facebook, building up um, our data set, essentially, that's another uh, target set that we use is those that are um, innovators um, across the board, regardless of where they're coming from. Well, I can take my turn. Is that okay? There's a, a number of big points that I want to cover, and I'll begin with one of them. Um, uh, a, a big part of the material is, is Ellen's uh, lecture material um, on uh, surveillance capitalism and um, basically uh, the way globalization is taking place which is not at all in the direction that it needs to take place. And Ben T, um, you signal that we all have on our own way that basically business schools, capitalism, uh, so much is happening in the wrong direction. Um, and, uh, and we really need to, I mean, that does need to become a, uh, I mean, a, a very big part of the material. So I'm glad that it's there. And Ellen, I really enjoyed the material that you brought to bear on the topic, also some of the media that was brought to bear on the topic that you can just grab from the internet, TEDx talks, you know, Netflix trailers for um, the social dilemma and so on and, and so forth to give a sense that um, really this, this, this um, our globalization um, is, can take very dark and dy dystopian uh, uh, forms. And, Collectively, I think we obviously want to do something about that. And I think we could all appreciate that what's, what's required to turn that around. Of course, it's a daunting problem, but in part, it's going to be institutional. Um, and uh, back to what Ben T was saying in terms of, you know, we have to work with businesses and, and institutions and, and we have to work at that level in addition to working with youth. I mean, it's going to have to be that big a, a project. I made a name for myself at the workshop I attended with, with Ben, where halfway through the proceedings, I erupted and I said, enough with youth already. Yes, youth are important, of course, 
but youth plus so much more. We need to be reaching the leaders, the, the elites, the Leviathan organizations. We need to be reaching everyone with this and then what it takes to, to um, uh, turn it around is gonna have a huge external component of institution building and so on and multiple multiple scales. And that's what brings me to my next major point, which is if you look at the arc of the material that, that's been assembled so far, we begin with Owen's material, kind of outlining many of the problems, and then proceed to the three stories, ending up with the third story. And the best that we can hope that to do is to result in a transformation, an inner transformation in the mind of the people we're trying to reach. That's the best we can hope for with what's been presented there. And of course, that's wonderful to do that. And it's essential to do that. But it is only necessary and not sufficient. Because if you, if you accomplish that inner transformation, then the question is, OK, what are they going to do on that basis now that you have changed something inside their minds, how are they going to act? And in the material presented so far, there's no guidance for that. There's an un unstated assumption, an implicit assumption that when we change people's minds, then they will know how to act without our assistance. And that's for the most part, not true. And so I have this conversation in many different sectors because, and also spiritual sectors such as Buddhism and his Holiness the Dalai Lama and, and uh, the evolutionary leaders is that the inner transformation has to be accompanied by an outer transformation. We need to do social work in addition to inner psychological work. And that again can be done at many levels. So, so, so uh, I'll make the point here is that to just to summarize, it's great that we're a portion of this is devoted to outlining the problem. That we're not that that uh, that we can we can acknowledge and 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 deal with the fact that uh, the globalization, the development of the global system here, is not for the common good, the way that it's going. Not at all. Democracy is at stake, as one of the people that was interviewed. Uh, is, I mean, so this is frightening. And then we have another path that's a much more optimistic uh, 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 path. So we need to combine those, I think. And, and I was really happy to see the kind of the negative pole in addition to the positive pole, because if we don't have that negative pole, we don't acknowledge the negative pole, then we're just in some kind of la la land um, if we don't acknowledge the way things are going. And then to actually to deliver this material in a way so that we're not leaving people high and dry about how to act upon it. High and dry. <clears throat> that we've inspired them and then they're just, have we provided no assistance for how they might get together, especially in groups and do something on that, on that basis. And so I do think that the project needs to be oriented in a way that, 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 that does that basically, that, that, that does not restrict itself to some does not restrict itself to youth, youth plus more, and and inner plus outer. That there has to be some social work, institution changing, um, beginning with small groups and so on. So so uh, um, I, I maybe I've said enough for for uh, maybe a round of comments on that. But uh, so. If, if I may, let me comment on, on David's uh, as, as I guess the, the person behind getting, getting this, this course started. Um, uh, and, and David and I have had, have had discussions like this in the past. Uh, I, I agree completely with, with what he said, uh, that it's not sufficient just to, to uh, say, um, and, and bring about the, the, the problems, but you have to give people um, instructions on what, once, once they accept your premise, uh, you know, what do I do? Uh, 
my feeling is we're not creating just one class or one course. It's gonna be hopefully a series of courses that start by building some foundations and then move on. So uh, on the one hand, I feel that the most important thing that we can do first to establish a foundation is to educate people on the fact that there is something called the newsphere that is happening in, in our midst that's taking place. And, and just, just bring that, uh, I, I guess, uh, uh, appreci not appreciation, but, but uh, understand that, that this is happening and it's nature, it's a real organism that's forming. And what is it? Where did it come from, et cetera? And where is it heading? And then come, once, once people understand that there is this thing happening, the noosphere is happening, then you come back and say, look, the noosphere can, can have a, any number of outcomes depending on what we, the human race, decide to do. Evolution now is predominantly under the control of, of the human race. And we can collectively decide to take it to flourishing, but at the same time, if we don't understand what we're doing or succumb to uh, whatever our base nature pushes us towards, we can be pushing towards um, just the, the, the um, I guess, the, self and 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 self self enriching and going to Michael's uh, points of uh, uh, humanistic management versus you know what goes on today in 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 teaching kids about uh, in in a in a in an MBA program you know uh, we need to then tell them how these policies and and these kinds of approaches what what have they resulted in versus where we can go and uh, in taking advantage of our technology. So, so while I agree with David, uh, I just wanted to point out that we want to take this in steps. And the, the very first step is to, is to point to, uh, is to bring the knowledge of the new sphere out there. And the fact that yes, on the horizontal, and I'm bringing up my my analogy of on the horizontal plane, which is the time, the, the current time and space, there are all these problems and a lot of people are screaming bloody murder about them and, and wonderful and we support that. But we want to point to the vertical axis, which is look, evolution, uh, human evolution is moving upwards and forwards. And we want to understand that. And the fact that while we're shooting a, a rocket to the moon, any any misguided, um, uh, I guess, or any miscalculation, we can, we can be floating in space, blowing ourselves up rather than reaching our destination. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll just stop at that. I'll pop in with a couple of questions. Um, I'm also happy for others to go, uh, but um, David, for you, um, in terms of leading people to a solution or something to do, um, in my mind, do we have an evangelical agenda or do we have an activist agenda is the question. And it doesn't have to be like specific evangelical in terms of a particular um, you know, idea, but um, that's a question that came up for me. And Ben, for you, my question is about new sphere because you probably are the one who knows the most about it in the room and most committed to it. Um, I have a colleague in the management spirituality and religion group who works with social consciousness. And I really was trying to understand the difference between the two or the commonalities between the two. And I'm ignorant of both of those, 
but I've heard both of these terms. So if you have any thoughts on that, I'd be very happy to hear them. Well, I'd like to have David uh, answer you first, and 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 I'd I'd be uh, acknowledging that I'm I'm not the foremost in knowledge about the noosphere. I I bet David uh, uh, has has gotten even deeper into it than me, but I'd I'd be happy to come back and. Well, uh, Jody, uh, I need to get clarification from you as to what distinction you're making between activist and evangelical. Um. Good question. <laughs> I love questions that generate more questions. Thank you. I'll have to, um, in my mind, um, activists can be activists with, uh, like, here's what we are bringing down. And evangelical is more like, here's what we want to be building. I'm thinking out loud. I don't really know what I'm saying. <laughs> well, by that by that score, I, I, I'm proud to call myself an evangelical. But uh, and I think that another another thing that evangelical brings up is a worldview, a strong worldview that that organizes action. And of course, you know, Christian evangelicals have a Christian worldview. We have another worldview, and um, and it functions in the same way as a religion. I mean, if that's what the third story is all about. So yes. The whole, the whole acknowledgement of a vertical and, uh, and, and the idea that we have a cosmology, basically, you know, truly a cosmology, uh, uh, one that's based on science, um, but that functions in a way that gives us a sense of meaning and purpose, just like a religion. So this is like, you know, a science-based religion is what it is. It's a true union between science and, and religion, which is amazing. So I think that, uh, so evangelical is what I would go for. And then, but of course, action flows from it. And uh, as I sometimes put it, if there's something inside your head that doesn't influence what you do, you should get rid of that thing. And the whole purpose for a worldview is to motivate constructive action. And so that's what we're, we're doing. And, and I think that um, I hope um, um, at some point in, the, in, in our time together, we spend a good chunk of time, I'm sure we will, uh, but basically uh, uh, asking about how this is gonna be delivered, to whom and, and how this is going to be um, uh, delivered. One point I think to make is that it needs to be delivered to elite audiences in addition to youth um, audiences. There's no reason why this can't be taught. And as, as part of our discussion, let's organize something for the Jesuit community that the, the, the reaches the elite Jesuit community, the deans and department heads of colleges and, and business schools and, and, and so on. Our opportunity for communicating, mean, obviously the, the details of what we communicate at that level will be different uh, perhaps than, than for, other, uh, for other sector. There's a question of who we reach. And then there's the question of the style of pedagogy and I hope we can be discussing, there's a standard style of pedagogy, basically students in seats being lectured to. Um, and then there's other forms of pedagogy, which are sometimes called an arc of inquiry. Um, uh, they draw upon them. Uh, Michael and I have been talking with two wonderful gentlemen from the Presidio Management School, Ron Nazer and Dwight Collins. It's mm -hmm. said right away, you, you, when you, when you work with individuals, you ask them, you know, what interest, situate everything in terms of their current interest and an action plan. But from the very beginning, it starts out with some kind of action plan that then gets informed. And for this to take place in small groups rather than just some individual odyssey. And so I think that, um, and also we should be doing many different things. Uh, Devin, I think, pointed pointed uh, to this, we should be evolutionary. We should be trying stuff out and, and measuring it and then adjusting it again and again and again. And the faster, the faster, the better. So I think we do want to be uh, not to decide upon what's the one thing we're going to do. Uh, we need to, to uh, decide upon multiple things to do and then, and then be really good at assessment and tracking and 
all of that stuff, which you can do now with the um, internet tools and and so on. So um, so uh, that uh, um, is there a, a, a period of the workshop that will be explicitly devoted to to uh, basically um, who we're delivering this to and kind of ped pedagogical the ped pedagogy yes. surrounding it. Yes, so the, the next uh, step would be exactly that. But before we get there, I think it'd be good to just have everybody air their quote unquote grievances or just address all the challenges that they see. Um, and what I'm hearing so far is a little bit the, okay, action orientation that's missing from the current material. I don't hear anybody sort of disagreeing with some of the content presented, even though Jyoti, you're sort of saying this might smack of Scientology. And I, I just, I want everybody really to share what are the sort of deepest <laughs> uh skepticisms that you have that were raised by some of the the conversation i can say that of course the social te techno social dilemma is not only visible in the uh current context of surveillance capitalism but it could be that's just one one piece that we are all connected with right there are lots of ways of how we mix up means and ends and and that Okay, Jyoti, you, you, you want to correct yourself. Okay, good, good, good. So I, I'm just trying to, to summarize what I'm hearing and it may not be accurate. So just to move the conversation forward in terms of what, what other sort of pieces are that, that we want to be aware of in terms of how we address it. Uh, but then of course the conversation will be about what would we be doing in the various domains that we are. Ben, I would sort of see you in business ethics, organizational ethics, that perspective, Ellen, you in communication in the traditional rhetoric way, Kimberly, you in the space of communication, like skills-based uh, communication and development, Jyoti, you in strategy in the MBA education, David and Ian, you in, in the ways that you see that would fit at maybe the, the higher level audience uh, at a ubiquity or <laughs> for a social, uh, Ian in your course as well. So that's maybe where we can shift uh, slowly, but I, I just wanna make sure that we've had the time uh, to address all the potential uh, questions. And Jyoti, do you wanna clarify? And Kimberly, can do you? I, uh, mm -hmm. If I may take a, a, just uh, make a couple of comments to put the human energy project in perspective, and also the knowledge of the newosphere or the subject of the newosphere. Uh, really, when I started the Human Energy Project, I decided that I wanted to break it into three components. Uh, track A was dissemination, just to bring the, the, this uh, knowledge or, or the fact that there is something that's called the newosphere uh, that, that is happening. And two is the science and technology track. And that is whatever we go out and, and, and disseminate, I wanted to make sure that it is founded on very sound scientific basis. And, and the third track was, um, what was, uh, the, the, the ethics. Okay. There, there's the newest fear. We know it's founded on science. What are we supposed to do? Um, okay. And, and, and just lately, um, I created a, a fourth track and that is, education as a result uh, michael of what what you and i started doing um, um and, and 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 david actually i started with david on the education part who, who introduced you so let me the the important point that i want to that i want to bring up is the human energy is not coming in saying we know everything now we have a plan and we're going to move forward in fact i've said it from day one i don't know what the hell i'm doing i'm just learning as I go along, because I, I don't know that too much, any, any amount of work has been done in, in, in what human energy is undertaking. I, I know where, where I want us to end up, but I don't know the best path. And then we, we well, I, I'm for sure me, but I doubt if, if there are too many people out there who really know the nature of the newsphere. It's something that's forming now, and we need to study it further and understand it further as we go along. And connected with all of that is, well, we're teaching it or we're trying to let people know how do we convey that while at the same time we are developing more and more knowledge. We are investing in, in research. So I, I just want to have that background there 
the, the, to me, one of the most important things, I, maybe Devin asked me or someone asked me, well, what, what, what is it that is the, the most important thing in the new sphere? And, and, and to me, it's global consciousness. And that's what Joyti asked me. She, she called it, I think, social consciousness, but I call it global consciousness and, and the global brain that Teilhard spoke about so much. But how much do we know about that? I have, we have, we're funding research uh, on that as, as we speak, just to, to learn more. So all I, all I wanna say is the, the course that we're developing, we're just starting on, on a nucleus of something and experimenting. And as we move forward, more and more of what we develop, we'll, hopefully we'll, we will introduce as, as we go along. Kevin, you said you had a comment you wanted to make. Yeah, um, it's just, I love this question of, you know, what are we up to here? What are we doing? How do we show up in the world in this? Are we evangelicals, activists? There's a lot of different ways to think about what we're up to. Uh, a really simple term in my mind that I've been using is we're, we're a humanistic movement or a group of people that are moving in some sort of direction aimed at humanism. Where, what, what are we moving towards or what are we contributing to? The first thing that comes to mind for me there is the complexity consciousness. We're bringing awareness of the complexification of consciousness and we're actually facilitating the complexif complexification of consciousness within the individual. Just speaking from my own experience, my consciousness has become certainly more complexified and, and deepened as I, I deepen into these materials and understand myself with relationship to the noosphere and the dynamics of the universe as a whole. So that's one layer. And then the other thing, and I'll just have to channel Brian Swim here uh, for a helpful analogy, is just thinking about how stars come in online in a galaxy. They, they come online through density waves moving through the galaxy and igniting the, the catalyzation of stars. And so that's another way that I look at what we're up to. We're, we're like a density wave. We're, we're a concentrated group of people that are moving through the society, through the collective consciousness, and we're igniting people. We're igniting people and institutions and ideas, and we just keep moving. And, and eventually, you know, the galaxy becomes full of stars. So didn't think of that myself. That's all, Brian. But, you know, that's, that's one way to look at it. I love it. And if I may add, I mean, I'm using three E's to describe the kind of work that we're doing with the humanistic management network, which is like enlighten in the traditional humanistic <laughs> educational perspective, but also enliven like the energy piece and then empower. I think that's the action piece that you, David, are referring to, because in, in the context that we're operating in, it's, of course, management, it's action. It's like you do things with a purpose. The question is just what purpose, right? And here's where the noosphere fear can come in. And what is your connection to others? I think that's the foundational disconnect that we see currently in the world, that that is not not seen as much. And that's where the consciousness raising piece is, is really sort of critical but then how do you do that i think we we may, may not be able to prescribe necessarily very specifically how uh, but i think we can point to examples where that is being done and we can teach those or we can have an inquiry like david you were saying the arc of inquiry uh, that's if, if people are inspired by that kind of conversation and question then i think they'll find an answer and Ben Tihanka, you were mentioning this uh, this notion of action research that you guys are doing, I think, at the MBA level with everybody, right? So the question would be, how could those connect? Is there something that informs that? How would students be be guided through this with that material? Is there anything that you see? And so um, maybe we can move into that conversation, but I just want to make sure that Kimberly and, and Ian and anybody else who has not yet sort of uh, shared the content-based uh, conversation. Just please make sure that you're you feel you're represented in, in the current conversation. Well, um, first of all, I want to say um, I really enjoyed going through the material and the course, um, Devin. I really I love the videos. They're really well executed. I. Um, I had some questions um, and the first question really is about calling the noosphere the third story versus an evolution. Because um, in my mind, 
the first story and the second story talk about how the world was formed from the very beginning, from nothing to something. And the noosphere in terms of being a third story from what I got from the material is it starts with the sprinkling of people around the world as connecting points for this global mind. It does not address primarily how the earth came into play. So um, I can, if it's, if it is a combination, yes, of the first and the second and, and an evolution, but that was just a question that came to my mind. Um, the, other, um, the other question that I had um, was in the way that the first story is actually presented within the material. It's presented very scientifically without any of the, the, um, the connection that religion is supposed to bring people, which is presented later on in the material. Um, actually, I guess that's in the sacred um, life and living earth story, which to me was much more religion-based um, teachings that was totally omitted from the first story the way it was presented. So I had a question about that um, and how that came to play. Um, I echo what David is saying in terms of action. I see this as a, an awakening um, and a really powerful awakening in terms of where we are and um, what is evolving around us and the power of that and to be able to grab onto that power, to be able to shape it, but no real action steps in terms of doing that. Um, so and maybe if someone can address those, those three issues, um, that would be great. Perfect, thank you Kimberly for sharing. This is a very, very important and, and great observations. Ben, you also wanted to share something. Maybe we can, you can, you can do that. And then Ellen, Devin, myself, Ben, uh, maybe David, if you, we wanted to come in uh, to answer Kimberly's and Ben's. Ben? Ben T. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Uh, yeah, I found the material very engaging. I've seen some of the stuff that was shown in the videos, but I saw them in a different light when I went through the material, especially Zuboff and, and the social dilemma. But what I really appreciated was the way it means to connect science with, with humanities, humanism. Because I think that is really a major source of many of the problems we encounter in the world and which is institutionalized in our system of education to really separate this, these two elements of reality which are actually uh, integrally connected. So I think uh, when it says, for example, the discourse of science undermines narratives of meaning and purpose, that's, that's precisely correct, I think. And that's what I appreciated that by trying to reconnect these, we are trying to address one of the core sources of the problem. And then I think by doing that, the material helps the, the learner understand or prepares a good foundation for understanding why we are in this situation and maybe prepares later on for action. And I'm an activist myself, so I really have a very strong bias for action. But I always remind myself that good action must be based on good understanding. And so I think this, this this uh, effort to connect humanities and science is a very good foundation for real understanding and, and therefore for, for meaningful agency. Uh, I did think though that maybe the, because the way it says is the discourse of science undermines traditional narratives. 
But actually, uh, those of us in, who teach philosophy of science really point out that it is positivistic narratives that undermine meaning because not all science is positivistic. There, there is a whole range. So maybe that's one question in my mind. W will it be better to say the positivistic discourse of science undermines because there are other narratives of science? Because I think later on, when we try to reconnect science with, with the humanities and spirituality, then that's, that's a good setup. The other question that came to my mind, and, and this is related to another uh, feature of the material, is uh, the objectification aspect. Uh, I was trying to reflect on whether we can deepen the presentation and say that the capitalistic business model inherently has the objectification. And this was amplified when advertising was really introduced, right? So this was around the 20s when, when public relations and uh, targeted marketing slowly emerged. I, I remember the classic example of how the women were influenced to, to embrace smoking because it was attached to being uh, somehow empowered because they had just gotten the vote in the US and so British American Tobacco timed their advertising campaign and, and called the cigarettes as torches of freedom. And therefore it changed the social taboo against smoking in one fell swoop and created this movement for, for making more and more women smoke as a, as a political statement or, or a, a liberating statement. So I thought that even though a lot of these features are accelerated by social media and technology and big data and all that, I think that was inherent in the business model to begin with. And maybe that point can be made that it, it really amplified that, that for me really a, a, a big defect in the, the business model that tries to, to convince a person that he wants something really against his will because he's being manipulated, right? In fact, some, one author said that the cosmetic industry is based on uh, making women feel insecure and selling them back their self-esteem for a price, you know, something like that. So in, in behavior modification, that, that kind of becomes hyper uh, managed because of the big data and the experiments that go on, but that was already inherent there. So I, I think that's something that maybe can be enhanced in the material and that's struck. But that, that is an important message, I think, the objectification. And then the third and final thing I, I really appreciate it and I think can still be enhanced is this matter of institutions. And, and this was mentioned by David earlier. What is the nature of institutions? Well, there are things that, well, laws, for example, and this is why sometimes we don't think globally because our legal regimes are very different. And so the Americans will comment about the Chinese, forgetting that it was the Americans who outsourced their manufacturing to China and empowered the Chinese, right? So we were actually always connected. But since we have different legal regimes, we, we sometimes think that we are more separate than we actually are. So I think part of what can help connect science and humanities is we can deepen the discussion of institutions because it was mentioned in different places in the material uh, and kind of help the, the, the learner understand that uh, value systems, laws, uh, cultural cognitive meaning systems and normative systems, these are all part of what affects our mindset and sometimes separates us from the reality which we are trying to be part of in a, in a flourishing way. So, so it, it, it increases that disconnection because of the lack of understanding. And I like the way uh, uh, I think Devin was saying it earlier about complexification. I, I think I'm gonna have to learn that word in the sense that we understand that actually we are ultimately quite connected in ways that are hidden by what we see in an everyday sense. Uh, so those, those were the, the, the three main things that, that jumped up at me as I was going through the material. And related to David's question about pedagogy, I guess the challenge is how do we now help this uh, rather 
in a way, this is very radical material, right? Because it challenges the divisions that are there in the, in the way things are seen and they're, they're taught. And how do we make this friendly so that it can be absorbed by the, the average learner? So th those were the questions in my mind. But I'm really excited to see this project moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, anybody, uh, Jyoti or, or David or Ian, any, any other sort of questions about the material so that we can sort of maybe address it at all? I, I just want to share what I heard. A number of very important points in terms of clarification, Kimberly, in terms of whether Noah's fear equals the third story and how it may be an evolution out of the first and a second, like a sense-making system and and sort of having downsides here or there where uh, maybe the sacrality of it can actually be recaptured in a way that it is honoring the first story <laughs> or, or some of the elements of the first story I'm not sure that i i captured fully what what you were suggesting but i i heard that when you were mentioning it came up again in the, the sacred story um of 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 human nature and life that that may actually connect and potentially resonate with those that identify self-identify as religious and and uh, imbued with the first story right and 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 not sort of like okay well here that, that so that 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 kind of a reaction and also that honoring that dignity of that that uh that power and the fundamental need for a first story um connected with the second story and the third story as an evolutionary step forward cultural evolution i think and then uh ben you had three points one was science just to clarify what the science piece is and in fact yeah i think science in the anglo-saxon term is very much positivism and in many other cultures including my own german it's knowledge creation that's what science is and knowledge creation can happen at all levels. It's not like here's a scientific hypothesis tested, <laughs> falsified, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. That's what it has come down to in many ways. And therefore the nihilistic or the, the minimal perspective of, uh, not minimal, but a, a very reduced perspective on, on life emerges. And then objectification you mentioned wasn't mentioned, could be uh, built out and institutions, just sort of additions to the existing materials, right? Yeah, Kimberly and, and Ben, am I capturing that accurately? Okay, that's right, Mike. Super. Ian, yes. do you want to do you want to share some more? Or David, I think we heard a couple of your points, but you also mentioned maybe you have some more. So I just want to make sure that we. I'm actually hear it all. from anyone who hasn't spoken yet, and then I do have a couple of points. I'll make. I'll try to make it as brief as possible. Yeah, I'll go. I was just in the middle of typing them in the chat, anyways. Um, so I just I still kind of functioning in listening mode and loving everything that's being exchanged. Um, but in terms of initial reactions to the course, um, again, I love the videos and the overall production quality. Um, and I was wondering if the sections on modern evolutionary thought could be expanded upon a little bit. Um, in particular, the, the notions of the major evolutionary transition and gene cultural coevolution as kind of part of the scientific basis for the new sphere. Um, I know it's kind of, it's alluded to and there's a lot of, there's text on the human energy website and whatnot. Um, but I think those might be fun ways to kind of, you could flush them out in fun ways to be designated modules or something like that, just to give a little bit more grounding. Um, and then I'm also wondering how this movement connects with kind of similar ones. Um, and the first thing that's coming to mind is the interspiritual movement kind of a la Teasdale and Kurt Johnson. So there seems to be some tremendous overlap there. So, so Ian, what I'm, what I'm hearing from you is also sort of suggestions for additions and maybe sort of additional sort of complexification as this Devin would say. Is that accurate? Yep. Okay. Jyoti, you had mentioned very strong reactions that you were not willing to share and and and, and bias our conversation with, but I think maybe now is the time. <laughs> All right, share. thank you for the invitation. Um, I feel I need to defend my Scientology uh, off the cuff remark. Uh, so uh, I love the idea of a religion based on science and um, 
I know Scientology has some particular reputation, so that may not be a good way to use it. But uh, what Ben just said about we're already connected, but it's more visible now, and the need for words like complexification of the consciousness or world consciousness as another way to wrap our heads around this is where I'm coming from. And what I'm going to say is, um, I was born into a Hindu family, but we are Sindhis and that's the land of Sufism, which 700 years ago was fighting the battle between Islamists converting Hindus and reacted with poetry and dance as the way to worship. And I've K through 12 undergraduate years, and now for 15 years been at Catholic institutions. So I'm more Catholic than Hindu. Um, in my mind, the best thing that came from being born into a Hindu family was that there was no separation between religion and science. In India, when the scientists launched the rockets that goes into space, they have no problem having a prayer ceremony and cracking a coconut just before pressing the button to launch the scientific rocket. Because religion and science are not separated the way they are in a lot of other spaces that I've spent my life in. So that was the comment and that was the thinking behind it. Um, so I love this idea of new sphere. The production quality made it a little, uh, made me a little impatient, but I think if it is going to the millennials, it is the right level of branding, um, signature tune, consistency across that. So there was, you know, as an academic, I'm used to reading dull, boring material. And so this was not a dull, boring material. That's why the question of, you know, the uh, target audience for this. And um, I'm still sitting with the idea of the differences between New Sphere and um, the um, social and global consciousness. I personally wanted more about, um, I'm mis probably going to mispronounce his name, Tilehard. Because I am a storyteller and I think students remember stories more. Mm. Spreading the ideas and his ideas is great. But the minute David introduced himself as the modern incarnation of Tilehard, it was like, okay, I get this. And so there's this connection to human element of the story. And the fact that he was borderline renegade or was, you know, so devoted to his ideas that he was willing to take penalties for it in his personal life and yet be dedicated to the ideas. There's something very connecting about that. And when Devin started to explain and shared the screenshot of how the innovation spread and the innovators and early adopters is where we are with the new sphere idea and where we want to be. You know, we just like David said, he's the modern day incarnation. There's, they're floating around everywhere in New Sphere already. So if we can collect all of them, that would be great. So that's the next sort of video I want to see about his life and uh, the story that can be told that spreads the idea through the story. We do that very well at St. Mary's. Everybody at St. Mary's knows about Father LaSalle our founder and what he did and what he stood for. And that story resonates. Awesome, thank you. So Jyoti, what I'm hearing is, okay, you don't see necessarily the first, second story as much lived out in a context of a non-Christian uh, uh, culture, right? So I think that's important to note also, Ben, because if we want to sort of have more global impact, that kind of conversation probably will become more relevant. And then the question is really like, how does a new spin on these connections uh, uh, provide something on top of that? 
and I think Jyoti, if I if I recreate you correctly, you were basically saying this was such a high quality and entertainment uh, value in terms of the videos that you, as a traditional academic, were was you were more turned off than you were turned on. Is that accurate? Um, no, I wasn't turned off. I was questioning who is it targeted to. Mm. Um, I I I'm a little impatient with the signature tunes and the branding aspect of it but i understand the value of it and the power of it so it would work very well if i assigned this as a course because then there is consistency and um, structure which creates that institutional sort of legitimacy um same as you know the journals we publish or other things we have a way of branding them and including them. So um, this material was not aimed at me, but I love the idea. And I, if I'm going to use this to serve my students with, then I need to um, have the you know story that I asked for as the opening context to say, okay, run with this program, but here's why you should run with this program. Wonderful. And then what I heard is also maybe a bit more clarity on the difference between sort of similar yet distinct terms, or maybe they're overlapping terms in terms of global social consciousness, noise, fear, what are the differences, how, how would it potentially be similar? And then I think the, the most specific recommendation was a video, a production video on Tailhard and his life and, and things like that. And we do have some of that in the course. I just wanted to mention that. And then it was deemed too long. It was not supposed to be about Tailhard and, and, and that. But I, I do think that's where you're putting it into. Like that personalization and that story can be powerful, much like you said about LaSalle and, and how students can connect with that as a, as a personal. So in the spirit of that, um... I think the menu that allows you to see the entire series is helpful. And if it was curated for people to customize it, whether it's for the communication class that Kimberly teaches or the strategy class that I teach or the innovation course that I teach, that would help because each module is standalone and complete in itself. But which module which instructor uses. From a design perspective, we don't have to develop the entire curriculum. We have to leave space for people to customize it according to their need. And that's where the you know, distinction between activism and evangelism comes because if you give me the freedom to choose the you know, three videos I might show out of 30, that makes me fully on board right away. But if you say you have to show all 30 because that's our story, then I'm like, you know, my class doesn't have that much time for me to include this. Because I'm held accountable to the learning goals that the accreditation agencies want. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Jyoti. Awesome. And David. So much to say. <laughs> um, uh, oh, boy. So. Uh... Picking up on Jordy's points, uh, uh, we've been uh, happy to present some of these videos to audiences. Uh, and we can testify most recently during World Unity Week. Um, and uh, we can testify that they land very well with, with some people. And we can never expect any more. No story is universally loved. No story universally, universally resonates. And so we're definitely going to have to tell different stories to different segments of the um, of the um, of population. The actual story of Tehard, I think, is a good story, especially if it's connected to the modern evolutionary science. So at some point, and, um, and um, Alan, my associate who's not here, but with whom I'm working, and is part of the Human Energy Project, has thought along those lines. And how could we uh, base uh, uh, this on the story of uh, the actual story of uh, Tehard, make it captivating in, in this way. Ian's point about um, about the um, inner spiritual community raises raises the point that, but just to say what that is, um, um, it's a movement. It's a it's a, a transcultural 
movement and the way Kurt Johnson described it is that all religious and spiritual traditions and actually scientific traditions converge upon a common awareness of rich interconnectedness, a common awareness of rich interconnectedness. Of course, Tehard is one path to that conclusion, but there's so many others. There's so many others, all the religious traditions, Hindu, you name it, uh, Christian, you name it, especially in their contemplative sort of mystic versions converge upon, and then so do the sciences, complex system science, cosmology, environmentalism, all converge on the um, um, awareness of rich interconnectedness. And once you take that on, certain conclusions follow, namely the futility of one part of the system attacking another part of the system. That's what a complex systems view gets you, is the futility. You see bad things happening and you realize those bad things are systemic problems. You can't just attack the problem. You have to change the whole system. And so that provides what's called a, a, a second tier of consciousness is the way they put it, that uh, we could all meet a meeting place for no matter which what your first tier of consciousness is, your particular tradition it might be Teilhard, it might be something else, it might be science, it might be religion. There's now this new space, this, this second tier of consciousness that we could all meet, communicate, and not abandon our first tier. We can't do that, that's part of who we are, but we can actually appreciate them and sample them more than ever, uh, more than ever before. And I think that that's very, very important for us to take that on and to realize that we are one thread. For those of us that are inspired specifically by Teilhard, then we are one member of the inner spiritual community interacting with other people who have come to that place by other roots. And Teilhard himself said that when in his famous quote, all things that arise must converge, right? Isn't that, all things that arise must converge. That's this kind of meaning space. And so in my book, This View of Life, I begin and end it with Teilhard, but on, you know, Teilhard appears on page one, but on page three, I say, this speaks to the need for just global cooperation, no matter how you think of it. You might be an economist, you might be somebody, somebody else. So play hard plus, plus more. And then um, I want to say, I want to address, um, I think it was Ben's point about it being specifically positivism, the uh, approaches to science that, that result in this lack of purpose that, that Ben associates with the second story. And I want to actually add to that by saying, in many ways, it is, it is specifically evolutionary science that led to that. Because evolutionary science led in the exact opposite direction that Teilhard pointed to. Teilhard's handling of evolution was of the third story variety, but where evolution actually went influenced by Mendelian genetics was that evolution has no purpose, that variation is always random, only the environment does uh, selection. And so it is specifically um, evolutionary science that led to this second story problem and maybe more generally positivist science, but definitely specifically evolutionary science. And by the same token, as we build the third story, there's something specifically evolutionary about that. And that is the point that Ian raised that uh, so much of the content that's been created by Devin and, and Brian and Evelyn has to do with our cosmology, the evolution of the universe or complex systems in general, quantum mechanics, basically the whole physical systems. But much of what we need to know in order to build the, the, uh, the noosphere is specifically evolutionary. And I know that, and of course, that's what I bring to the table along with Alan, but I also know that some of the videos that are in production are going to get there, basically, and the, the, the episodes that that um, have not yet been, uh, not yet been uh, produced. And then finally, I think finally, um, I wanted to make the point that when we talk about humanism, as, uh, as many of us have, including in Devon, um, 
I think that, yes, what we're doing is definitely humanistic, but there's something about humanism dating all the way back to the Enlightenment that was individualistic. And so part of what we're talking about is, is individualism and going beyond individualism to a more systemic, holistic view uh, that has features much more community. And to some extent, that goes beyond humanism, at least as an intellectual tradition. Humanists, I speak with a lot of experience, and you have a lot of experience too, is deeply individualistic. It's the heroic individual thinker, reasoner that's celebrated by, 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 uh, uh, by humanism. And so the systemic complexity and, and, the, and the, you know, the, the feeling of sacredness uh, that we are, as part of what we're, we're doing, is actually goes against the grain of a lot of humanists, a lot of humanists. They really insist on being, you know, each individual as his own God. And then the reason we cooperate is because we reason our way to agreement um, as heroic individual thinkers. And, there's, and, and so, so uh, much of what we're doing is beyond individuals. I mean, uh, it could even be described as the, you know, the enlightenment evolving. And, um, and so that's, that's part of what's on the table. Yes, it's humanistic. And at the same time, it's a, I feel it's a new form of individual, of humanism. And then, and then that message needs to reach humanists. So, so, uh, so there's that. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, thank you. I think we have a lot on, on the plate. And Ellen, uh, Devin, and, and Ben Kay, if you wanted to respond, I mean, I have certainly taken the notes. And I think there are some things that we can take offline and discuss later. But <laughs> apologies. Is there something that you wanted to respond to? Maybe Ellen, you first uh, immediately. Um, so first of all, I just want to say thank you so much for your really careful attention to this. Um, I was so happy as I was writing, as I was taking these notes, because it's clear that you um, <clears throat> um, got the basic idea and then could see all the, all the things that we need to add and, and edit. So thank you. Um, I wanted to respond specifically to one comment of, of Jyoti's because when I first read Teilhard, I was very struck um, by his, what I would call his philosophy of, of imminence, this notion that um, uh, spirit and world are the, are the same. Um, they're, not, they're not a dichotomy. And um, I was struck by how similar um, pieces of Tehard are to the Upanishads, which I had to read recently as, as part of a yoga class. And, um, and so I think it, is possible to articulate a broader um, a broader context that would that would take Tehard out of the sort of purely Western Christian approach, and so I'm really interested in doing that. And so, if you have if you have more thoughts, um, I would love to hear them. But I will definitely look at ways to to sort of um, to broaden the the message there. Any, any other comment, uh, Ellen, on, on any of the other observations or Devin or Ben? Um, I, I completely agree with David that we need to talk more about action. I think even my students who liked the class um, were saying the same thing. Um, and um, I think every, um, every other comment, I really liked Ben's um, specific um, concerns with um, using science, you know, too broadly. And so um, both the um, moving toward um, a particular critique of positive positivism, which I am, which I'm familiar with, and the sort of broader bringing in of um, the negative narratives of evolutionary science, which I'm less familiar with, but, um, but David was talking about in the negative way and Ian was talking about in the positive way, the sort of new evolutionary science. So again, thank you very much. Devin, Ben, do you wanna respond 
right now or just make some general observations and then i think for everybody else we will we will reconvene and just sort of assess some of the the feedback also and so i i i said i i think it's great it's very helpful um devin you okay. want to comment or ben the, the the i think the comments are all fantastic to to guide us into you know getting course to move forward okay there's a, a great amount in here um for for us to analyze and, and food for thought, especially for Ellen and for you, Michael. I mean, you you got, you are the two guys who really put together module one and module two. So I'm I'm sure this is this is tremendous um, feedback for you. I I just I don't want to take too much time, but I, there was there was a, a you know, good solid discussion about the first story, second story and third story that was brought up. And I, I just wanna tell you um, the, the origin of how that got into the human energy project. When I sat down to write down why um, my foundation for my board, why should we undertake uh, th th this project and for what purpose? Um, I, I struggled with going back to, to my, you know, to where I came from and how they are influenced me, et cetera. And, and, and with that, I'm, I'm not a scholar uh, and I'm, I'm not a specialist in any, in any of this, I'm an outsider, but in, in my own simplistic way, I translated it to the fact that, look, you know, the, the, the first story, which is really an amalgam of the creationist stories that, that all cultures are, most cultures are based on. And, and that story tells you where you came from, where you're going, and, and what you're supposed to do with your life during your life, okay. And, and then I, I conceptualize then uh, the, the maybe the attack on that first story was the second story, which was a story of science, and that is uh, Teardian in the sense of uh, evolution. Um, it, 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 uh, I'm sorry, I should take Teardian out. It's a, the second story is science. Um, okay, which starts with the Big Bang, uh, with with uh, uh, randomness, uh, quantum mechanics, etc., and and evolution, and the fact that evolution doesn't have a direction, and therefore. You know there is no meaning in life, and you create your own meaning, which really undermined the first story. And then for me, I came to what Teilhard was saying, and I said, "Well, that is the third story. The third story is based on science, because Teilhard is based on science. The difference is that the third story brings about the directionality <clears throat> in evolution. Yes, uh, there's randomness." In, in, in the universe and randomness is, is used to, to a great advantage uh, in, in, as we move forward. And, and um, especially with Teilhard saying, evolution does have a direction, especially human evolution has a direction and therefore life has meaning. So that, that was the genesis and a very, very simple minded, maybe uh, approach to, to tell a, a quick story, uh, at least to my board to say, look, you know, there's a first story, second story, we want to tell the third story. And that is based on the noosphere. I, I just wanted to bring that up. We need to develop that further uh, and more meaningfully, uh, but that's the genesis of it. But in, in general, this, this, is, this is great feedback. Devin, any, any comment? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, again, I just want to echo a big thank you and gratitude to everyone. My main comment is I officially want to go on a walk and talk with everyone in the Zoom individually. Um, that's aimless in where we physically go, but the direction is focused in, on these, these topics because obviously there's just a lot here and you guys have all brought in some wonderful insights um, that are really important. One of the things around action, it's a, it's a huge question, right? And in working with Journey of the Universe for three years and seeing all the community that's around that, that's always the question that people ask, you know, what do I do now? And Mary Evelyn and Brian have various ways of responding to that. Um, Thomas Berry did as well in terms of 
you know, calling it, this is the great work is to discover how you contribute to the realization of this paradigm um, in the institutions, in your own life, in your communities and all that. But what's really interesting is there's a sense of knowing that we can't actually tell you exactly what to do. Part of your role as a human is to look at this paradigm and see where you connect to it which is this empowering of the individual. And we can facilitate that with institutions, with curriculum and various support. But just speaking from my own path, I would say that I'm the type of person that you know we want to be reaching. And, and what happened to my career where I was going down a more capitalistic path and now has been completely centered on this work. You know, I'm a case study of how did that happen? We would want other people, whether whatever discipline they're involved in to say, okay, I was going this way, but now I'm gonna go this way. That's in an alignment with these principles, these ethics and so forth. And thinking of my own experience, nobody told me what to do. I asked Mary Evelyn and Brian and they said, you know, that's, we don't know your life. We don't know everything that's, that's going on with it. You have to, and we all feel that, right? We have to each, each step in our own path is, is, is informed by the environment around us, but we ultimately were taking it ourselves and it's very empowering and inspiring. And I think, the students sense that as well. And so I just want to offer that up in terms of this action perspective of like, we do want to, we do want to encourage action. David, oh, after you, go ahead. Oh, we, we do want to encourage action and, and it's very important, but we also want to empower the individual to integrate this into their own life um, because from my deep time cosmological, you know, time developmental perspective, that's what humans are here to do is to, to make that intentional choice to go down that path. And so just encouraging and saying, yes, we're here to support, but also it's some of the answer is going to come from you. And in working with Brian and Mary Evelyn, I saw that in their eyes. They're saying, well, we're looking at you for what's going to happen because you represent the next layer of humanity in terms of uh, generations and so, so, and so forth. And so I think that a lot of the people that we'll be speaking to will be feeling that to some degree. And so that's just a helpful layer to just acknowledge what they're feeling, but also empower them to have experiences, journal, spend time in nature, talk to loved ones, to really work this material out in your life wow. such that you can see how you can reshape the institutions, corporations, and so forth that you're involved with. Um, so that's one layer that I thought was just important. Um, and in that sense, I thought that, it, you know, in that way, it is kind of humanistic, but not in the traditional sense. And so I'm wondering, is there multiple paths in humanism, like uh, how Ben spoke to in science of so there's many narratives and maybe part of what we're up to here is adding a different la layer or a different narrative to the tradition of humanism of saying, yes, you are a powerful entity unto yourself and have freedom and, and so forth and responsibility that comes from that. But that freedom and responsibility needs to be correlated with respect to a larger community, our planetary species, and uh, the responsibility that we have with this emergence of the noosphere that has the capacity to either significantly enhance life on Earth or take it down deteriorous paths. So I think that it, there's this, this fine line that we can walk there. Um, that's one note. And then, I mean, I want to respond to everything, which is seriously why I just like coffee, coffee, coffee with each one of you. But um, how does the third story in the noosphere relate? Um, you know, the, the, in my mind, one of the reasons why the third story is so important is because the third story is too big, or the noosphere is too big of a concept for the second story. The, the, the conceptual apparatuses that operate within the second story in our operating paradigm it's, it's hard to wrap your head around the noosphere when looking at that worldview. So then if you take a third story perspective, which has this deep time perspective that has been resourced and pixelated by science, but then also has this first story, you know, let's talk to, about the, the spirit, the essence, the movement of this. We need a combination of those two to really understand where the noosphere came from, where it's going and how we might relate to it. And so that might be a helpful way to understand um, the noosphere and that it is a, um, you know, if we were telling a story, it's an instigating event. It's a main character of the third story. Um, that's the way that I look at it. But the third story is much bigger than the noosphere, though the noosphere is, you know, the main act. 
So hope that's helpful in some way. Okay, wonderful. And I think I'm sure there are a couple more comments. And David, you wanted to make a comment. I just wanted to sort of uh, reposition ourselves in terms of the, the time we, we spent now two hours together. Maybe it's good to have a five minute break just for, for bio or other uh, airing coffee. purposes, but I, I coffee. Uh, at the same time, I do want to ask us uh, for a check in the next 55 minutes. Can we spend them with the intention to figure out like in terms of action, I think that's sort of the resonating piece, action. But what is it that we can do or that you can see yourself doing in terms of teaching it? And maybe we'll do a rapid fire kind of thing, just like what would work for you in terms of the content that you see that you can take from what we have been discussing, what was in the course to begin with, and what are sort of the missing pieces that we can sort of develop a next agenda on. I see Devin wants to meet in person. Maybe Ben, there is a, a next sort of step in terms of bringing everybody together physically if we're all sort of uh, vaccinated and other things and then spend, then maybe uh, create the end agenda for such a meeting to sort of figure out like what are the, the pieces that we wanna develop further for the various courses that we're teaching. I hear Jyoti strategy and innovation, Ben, it's organizational, uh, uh, it, it's governance, it's organizational management, um, institutions, et cetera, the sociology of organizations. Kimberly, for you, the various communication approaches. Uh, Ellen, the same for you, maybe De Devin and Ian, your, your perspectives, or maybe even the current courses that we're talking about in terms of co-developing. For me, it's management. And so if we start there, I think it'd be great if we can come back at 11, that's, it's 11.06, <laughs> it's 8.06, it's you, you name it, so that we would be back. Is that okay? Can I make my comment before the break? Sure. Sorry to delay everybody's <laughs> break because I will lose my thought and you might forget to. Um, Ellen, what you said about having read the Upanishads lately and making the story more inclusive or global is actually exactly the thing that would put somebody like me off. Because for me, the direction you wanna go to attract somebody like me would be to go deeper into claiming the story as is. So to me, if the first, second and third stories, religion, science and uh, religion of science that makes it much clearer. That makes me more comfortable to own myself if you own yourself fully. I have no problem spending my entire life at Catholic institutions and questioning, you know, am I more Catholic or Hindu? Because that's the kind of question human life is about. The labels don't matter. It's the intersectionality of what my next step is and who I want to be. And the Ramari retreat was one of my best experiences ever. And so, um, and that was only because they were so deeply entrenched and owning their own faith that it liberated me to be in that space of figuring out what my faith is, where I stand. So I don't want to see Upanishads or a million other indigenous traditions included, because to me that is tokenism and that is, you know, selling and saying we are inclusive rather than just being inclusive. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for Thank the break, you. Michael. <laughs> so yeah, can we come back at 11.08? Uh,
All right, are we back? I am. Excellent. Okay. So Ellen, do you want to maybe start for the rest of us to just share the course that you've been teaching, the setup, and uh, what worked, what didn't work? Very, very briefly. Sure. So I was teaching uh, rhetoric and public discourse this spring, which is uh, St. Mary's version of the basic public speaking class, although we add um, we add in some history of public speaking and um, debate into that format. And um, uh, I tend to teach this class from a comparative rhetoric perspective, meaning I look at <clears throat> a few different examples of, of public rhetoric um, from um, long, um, long time uh, culture. So, um, I use the Greek and Roman tradition, I use the Ottoman tradition, and I use the Chinese traditions of, of public rhetoric. Um, and at the end of that section, um, students are often confused, like, well, should we talk about harmony? Should we talk about persuasion? Should we talk about wisdom? Like, what is the, what, what should be the focus of our, um, of our own rhetoric? And so um, I brought in the the newosphere course at that point to um, remind us that uh, I'm going to use um, the language that that David uh, Sloan Wilson just gave us, which I did not have in the course. This sort of second tier of consciousness um, to say that like you're going to come across all kinds of all kinds of rhetoric in any moment. We're always in an intercultural position, right? We're always in, in intercultural context, whether we know it explicitly or not. Um, but I use the, um, the course on the newosphere um, to help students um, find some footing to think about their, um, their, um, their identities and others' identities and a place of, of commonality or conversation where th those can meet. In, in particular, I think you also mentioned that your students appreciated that and they wanted to know more tools, skills, actions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I tend to, um, I experience my students as living in a place of what I call dogmatic relativism. So maybe this is a function of California, but like, I think what I think and you think what you think and we're not gonna connect. We're just, you know, we're gonna agree to disagree. And so I wanted to try to push them past that or to, to give them another space for thinking um, across difference. Um, and so they, they were very attracted to the, the story of the newosphere because they saw potential in that story for that space. Okay, great. I know, uh, and maybe, maybe David, Ian, Kimberly, Jyoti, Ben, you want to just share what came up for you, how, if, 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 and it may also be helpful for us to know if it didn't <laughs> open anything up for you in terms of what you teach, uh, but yeah, just, just share maybe what, what opened up for you in terms of how you would approach teaching. Who are you asking, uh, Michael? You. Ben T, Jolti, Kimberly, Ian. I, I would prefer to go at the end of that sequence, if you don't mind. Okay, I'll jump in, Michael. Yeah, so what it did was encourage me to, to go further on the, the thrusts that I've had in the last five years, which, which have been on interdisciplinarity and connecting science with, with the humanities. So I think the idea of the new was fear as, a, as an encompassing uh, thought uh, envelope of some sort. It's something I'd like to try to, to introduce because we, we've been trying to get our students to have a more global sense and we haven't really formalize that. It's more of 
just just there in the back burner. Uh, so we, when we ask them to do action research, it's really a very local effort. They're working within their organization. They're dealing with uh, issues in the workplace, let's say uh, health issues or marginalization, or uh, a lot of times they also work on bread and butter issues of marketing and efficiency and all of that. But uh, I think what this gives us is a framework for looking at it more holistically. So that's, what, that's something I would like to try. I think the material introduces that idea rather neatly. And then tie it up with our action research frameworks in the local. So when you're acting in the local, you are still very mindful that you are part of the, 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 the interconnectedness. Uh, a lot of our students are working in transnational operations. Uh, we are the call center. Cent uh, we are the call center uh, leader of the world, so to speak. But uh, it's all via voice. And they, I often ask my students, do you feel that you understand the Canadians, the Americans, the Australians? Or is it just the, the accent that you're acquiring or whatever idioms are you're trained on? And I think that's something we want them to we want them to have a sense of really that that deeper sense of connection. So that's what's playing in my mind, Michael. I, I want to give that a try. So Thank basically, you. framing what you're teaching in terms of which which course specifically would it be the business ethics research. course? Action okay. research, Michael. Action research. Okay, so Action. framing that with the with the. And, and, you, and just tell us that the class that you're teaching, give us a little bit more context, is a MBA class? Yes, uh, all our MBA students take a required action research course because mm -hmm. their terminal project is an action research project. Mm -hmm. So they need to be change agents in the workplace. Uh, but And so they have to be deeply reflective about their purpose and meaning. So that's the part that appeals to me because their, their change effort comes from reflection on their purpose. Uh, but I've noticed it's a very local effort. It's, it doesn't really enhance connection in a bigger sense. So that's, that's where I think we can stretch the course a little bit and introduce this idea of the nose, nose sphere. Super, super. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Music yeah. to my ears, I, th I think Ben's too. <laughs> so <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> Jyoti, you, you were about to speak, I believe. And I don't want to put you on the spot. Uh, no, that's all, always okay to do. It's better <laughs> if you just tell me to shut up because one of the side effects of being a professor too long is that you tend to speak a lot. Uh, I would, as I said earlier already, if I had a choice of picking the three readings or three videos, I would do it today because I already use material from a bunch of other groups that have been working this similar agenda, whether it's the humanistic group, the MSR group, um, the story of stuff people. The video that particularly appealed to me was the visual of the globe being covered with the infrastructure lines for the past 15 years or so, I've been saying that just as the Chinese came to the West Coast to build the railroad, all the Indians arrived to build the infrastructure when the internet boom happened and created this weird bubble in the Bay Area where I can get access to more specialized Indian things than I could ever, even in Delhi today. In Delhi, I can only get like two South Indian restaurants. In the Bay Area, I have a choice of 20 with each regional cuisine of what part of South India you want that those are from. So um, that building of the infrastructure of new sphere and making that visible as the new sphere or global consciousness is the kind of stuff we talk about already, but to have the visuals and the interactive way is great. Um, 
I can't, the way the course was assigned to me to do everything doesn't work because there are elements of it that have nothing to do with my learning goals and objectives. Um, so because this material is so new still, I need a little bit more soak time, if you like, because I need to make sense of it myself, but it's very helpful to have it. For curriculum design purposes, most other places which are not so practice relevant, but catering exclusively to professors, they usually have separation between material for students and material for professors. So there's teaching resources, if you like, and something like that would make it easier for me to say, you know, these are my learning topics. And if I can search by learning topics, I'm looking for innovation related material, or I'm looking for, you know, something about surveillance against surveillance capitalism. I know directly where to go and talk about conscious capitalism. So keywords for teaching resources versus the student resources, because I don't really need to go through the student resources in detail multiple times. I only need to do that once. I get that much faster than they ever will. So, so teaching notes of some sort with combined material around an area, what I'm hearing innovation is one. Can you pinpoint to others? I would assume strategy, <laughs> but... Um, the, the more uh, specific, I think, the better for us. I'm just <laughs> putting that in there. But um... so the reason I've been dabbling with the arts mm -hmm. is because it raises consciousness. Because it is a way to it's a universal language which gets to. So I actually, Devin, thank you for putting the music in it and thank you for making it accessible at a limbic level rather than cognitive level that bypasses all the cognitive filters and the garbage of socialization into one or the other kind of ways of thinking. Um, I don't so much need Michael teaching notes. I just need the ability to search through the content. Okay. And I sure. also need more stories. So in addition to the founder's story, I when Devin said that he's a perfect case study for it, I'm like, Devin, I need to see your story because then I can repeat it. Mm -hmm. I can have Devin as a guest speaker in my class uh, on Zoom, especially if he's not in the Bay Area, then because stories make things come alive and are memorable. And uh, Judy, that, that's so it's very, very that's... abstract. I love abstract stuff, but my students don't. MBA students need practical stuff. They need examples that they can wrap their heads around. And they're less bothered about ideas, but ideas is where I love being. So, but I need stories to illustrate the ideas for my students. That's fantastic. So thank you. Thank you for that input. And, and also Jyoti, if you can uh, give us like areas, I hear the innovation piece but I'm assuming you have a number of other areas that we can pinpoint. And I know that Kimberly and I went through an exercise where we looked at our syllabi and looked at, okay, this is where it can connect. This is where it can connect. This is where it can connect and give it a twist. Like Ben was saying, his action research class. Well, this is sort of like a, a, a takeoff point for, for the research um, or action research uh, class. Would you see something that you feel would be particularly relevant. I, I hear the innovation piece, but I'm also assuming there must be something else in terms of strategy or something. But maybe you want to soak more, so <laughs> that's fine too. I think I've been doing it with the humanistic agenda. Mm -hmm. And this is very well aligned with that. Mm -hmm. The only reason I'm in this room is because I trust what you do um, and know that you know, you're involved with ideas which always blow my mind. And Ben does the same thing for me. Ben and I working on an AOM thing and his presentation last week in our preparation meeting was like, I'm still thinking about it. It just is so exciting. Um, Great. So, so, I mean, let's maybe have another conversation also in terms of like, what is your syllabus and what would it look like? Because Kimberly and I, I think did this rather fruitfully and we could we could potentially do this as a, as a follow up as well. If you're if you're up for that. Absolutely. Super. 
Kimberly, Ian, David, I think David, you wanted to go last. Kimberly, you want to maybe just share what what you see, maybe what you see newly, but also what we've already discussed. Sure. Um, you know, I see for the course that I'm, I'm teaching in the fall, the business communication one, which is a, um, a presentation course, preparing students for boardroom presentations as a group. Um, I see using the noosphere as a connectivity with others, um, not as wide as the connectivity of the global mind, but just the smaller global mind in the room and when you're connecting with people. Um, and I see that connectivity as also thinking about connection with yourself and how that will build confidence within you. So I think that as, as an important part for the students. Also the neural net technology um, that was mentioned within the material, I think that that is um, some other material that I'd like to include in that. For the spring course, I see the um, techno-social dilemma and dealing with um, social media and um, that effect, I think that I can definitely tie in the noosphere really greatly there. I love um, the idea of thinking of the noosphere as a place to meet, that to, a place for the global mind to come together, that you can be in different spaces. You can be in this individual space here on this plane, or you could meet in the global and so I think that that um, really plays into that whole um, leadership communication course, which is the business communication too, um, that I teach um, in the spring. So um, those, those are some of the insights that I'd like to share. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Ian, are you there? Uh, I see a blue screen. Oh, yeah, sorry, my, uh, <laughs> my thing on the whole time. Um, yeah, so if I was, I'm not actively teaching anything at the moment, um, and all my kind of courses have been fully focused on, you know, um, teaching about evolutionary theory and how that relates to and explains aspects of um, the human story and our experiences in daily life. So if I was to kind of bring this in, I think I would into a course, I'd probably spend about half the time just focusing on the kind of evolutionary aspects of it to really give a solid footing for you know students on kind of the mechanisms that are at play and you know bringing us to this point in time. Um, and then I really like to spend a bit of time, you know, driving the point home and that you know whatever it is that we're doing right now our, our current mode of existence is fundamentally degrading both sociologically and ecologically so there's some material in here on kind of you know the the various ways in which our social lives are deteriorating that i would use and i would probably beef that up with some ecological um, material as well and then the question for me is you know okay well if we can't do this anymore, what else could we be doing? What are the alternative narratives and, and visions um, out there? And that's where I think this noosphere is an interesting kind of, you know, meta concept for, you know, that a foundation for a new human story. There's, there's others out there. Um, but for me, it kind of all centers on that importance of values and uh, in, in particular shared values um, kind of all seem to stem from this assumption of, you know, that I, what I like to call unity of existence, that we're all in this together, we're all connected um, and what we do has consequences for ourselves and each other. Um, and really, uh, I lost my train of thought there. Um, so yeah, I, I think I would, like others have said, I would, there's a lot of material I would kind of pick and I would pull some aspects from and use, um, not necessarily the whole, whole course as it stands, um, because it wouldn't really fit into the context of things that I would teach. But um, I think it's a great kind of 
and you know example of an alternative and that's what people are looking for right now it's just what else could we be doing how are we going to relate to each other um, perfect great and i see some of the the connectivity with the some of the course ideas at least that i heard from the other sprint group and for for everybody else david ian and i with a number of other people were involved in a sprint group that david organized around rethinking well, maybe David, you want to talk more about it, but I saw yeah, it all about, about rethinking um, business education. But um, yeah, David, do you want to just jump in? Yeah, I think that um, um, Michael, Ian, and I have been involved in this uh, sprint group, as we as we call it, for rethinking the business school, business and management, organizational science school curriculum. And I think, I mean, speaking for myself, I just have a feeling of deja vu um, in terms of what we concluded and this project. Uh, one thing that we concluded is that um, uh, there's no one size fits all here, basically. What we are are a community of practice and we're, we're teaching separate courses or developing different courses and exactly what we need is going to differ and so what we need to be providing is some kind of inventory of material that can be continuously, can be cumulative and, uh, and a way for our to share our experiences with each other to basically to do things like we're doing right now on a recurrent um, uh, basis, um, to be doing research and so on. And I wanted to speak to Devin, um, uh, your focus on the individual and the importance of the individual and to just um, uh, assure you basically that this is absolutely where this starts. And the, the arc of inquiry is, as uh, one of the members of our group talks, it begins with the individual. What do you want to do? What's your passion? Where do you want to go with this? And then we'll build something around that. Um, and the, each and every individual is centered on their quest, basically, their, their path. But of course, Every path without exception is going to be a social path. It's going to involve, it's going to require finding and working with other people. And, and Teilhard himself was eloquent on that point. If you look at the end of chapter 10, which I've now almost committed to memory, thanks to, uh, thanks to Ben here, um, that, uh, you know, he talks about the individual and that, you know, freedom for the individual must be freedom in the company of others. Love is the is freedom and, and love is social. So 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 it begins with the individual and it's always done with, never done to, always done with, never done to. And so there's where you get that combination of individual and community that I think that we're all uh, working towards. And so there is such an affinity with what we're trying to do for rethinking the business and management school curriculum and the objectives of this group that I actually am going to recommend, Ben, and I could do so more formally moving over, a joining of those projects. Uh, and that, uh, and that uh, can please consider supporting what we're doing, which basically is going to take the business and management school curriculum as a context for what we're doing. And of course, that involves young people, people young enough to be students in such a a uh, course and at the same time what those students are walking into the world of business and management and, and institutions and so on we can simultaneously work with the the incoming class uh the incoming generation and what they're coming into that's working on the social environment in addition to the in addition to the um to the individual that's the inner and outer that we can be uh, that we can be doing. And of course, there'd be a huge Jesuit connection. Uh, basically, this would be an, a consolidation of some things that are already taking place separately. What Michael's amazing social network, what I'm bringing to the table, what you're doing, I think there needs to be a, a consolidation. And one of the things that we're uh, concluded is this kind of open-ended module uh, so that uh, it would really be like the kind of when you look at what you've assembled for this course, which includes some fresh lecture material from Ellen, uh, things gleaned from the internet, fresh video artistic material from from Devon. That should be, uh, and now packaged into this course, which we stepped 
through, that should be like an ongoing inventory that we, that, that we could add to moving forward. Anyone who says, oh, here's something, you know, here's, here, here's a lecture I give, or, or, or here's something I found on the internet, or, or so on and, and so forth, that this can be a, basically a, a, a accumulating common pool intellectual resource. It's one of the things we decided we wanted to do um, on the basis of our sprint group and have only just gotten started. So developing that concept. And then what could be done would be that there could be a, 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 a piece of that would be specifically about Tehard. And that we could, we could basically be developing this kind of material specifically inspired by Tehard and the third story framing, you know, our, that particular narrative and offering that to the community for them to, to for them to incorporate as I see fit compared to other approaches, so on and so on and so forth. That would be the true kind of you know cultural evolutionary process in which we throw we, we add our variant into the mix and then we and then we test it out and so on and so on and so forth. So uh, I, I'm very excited by this, especially if it can be proceed to join these different strands that have been that have been um, um, separate, that's great. That's the variation part of an evolutionary process and comparing and selecting and recombining. And so what we're doing basically is we're, we're doing a managed process of cultural evolution. Um, that's what we should be. That's what the next year is. And then a final point, a word I should never use, um, that the, the importance of of working in small groups as a kind of a cell of multicellular society. So if you think of, of the noosphere, the global noosphere, as, the, uh, as a vast multicellular superorganism, and if you think of the cells as not individuals, but small groups appropriately structured, then you learn so much about the noosphere and the underlying concepts by working at the cellular level, by working at the cellular level. That's what can be done right away is to form people into groups of their own choosing and then teaching many of the principles at that cellular level. And of course, then once the cells are strong, working with those cells to build up the, the levels of organization, the scale of scale of organization. And so, um, and so I think we're all in a position to do that. We already are doing that because so much of especially business school education is team-based was team-based at Fordham uh, before we got involved in introducing uh, uh, pro-social. And actually what we discovered with our research is that what Fordham was already doing team-based was awesome, worked well, worked as well as what we were suggesting. And that's a good prognosis. And so, uh, because there's all kinds of things out there that already work well. It's a matter of identifying it, generalizing it, beyond its local context and, and so on. So once again, teaching this in a way that, that's flexible enough so that someone like um, uh, Jody, for example, can pick and choose basically, because that's, um, that's what you were saying, Jody, is you need to have something that you can pick and choose from. Um, and so I think that there's a very important uh, uh, lesson there, in teaching in smaller groups, merging our projects, and and uh, uh, and so on. So uh, this has been a great meeting, and uh, I hope I'm not saying, you know, taking too much of a share in it. But uh, but uh, I do see loads of potential from um, from um, um, consolidating basically some of these things that have started separately. Wonderful, wonderful. That's fantastic to hear. Thank you so much, David. And I would assert you didn't take too much time. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure if, if my internet connection is poor, but uh, I at least, can you hear me well enough? Okay, because I, I did okay. hear sound from David well that the picture was somehow a little bit lagged. Um, so, okay, what I'm, what I'm hearing, just sort of like to, to make sure that I heard correctly, there are a number of different levels that we're at, Ben ready to go with uh, adopting a module in terms of an existing course that can be taken on. By the way, I was inspired by just listening to you because I was thinking about my management course, how I would do that and how we've already done some of that. 
But now when, I, I don't know if, if maybe Ian, you were talking, I thought, oh, well, my sustainable business course, I can do that. And then I think David, you were mentioning, and, and then you were thinking about the, the action research and it's like, oh, I have a social entrepreneurship course where I can use that framing. So actually I can do this and expand this in other courses uh, in different bits and pieces. So I'm, I'm just, I'm just sharing that, that, <laughs> and maybe that's coming up for some of you as well. And Jyoti, you and I, we're going to have another conversation, at least you and I, and maybe others, if, if they want to be involved in terms of figuring out like what are particular subject areas uh, that could benefit from, I'll just throw it out there, uh, Devin style, <laughs> media, video, uh, entertainment, edutainment uh, approach to to a conversation that ideally i think that ben that's where kimberly and i were coming from is like that can be scaled up right because if we want to scale it up i do think like jyoti was pointing to it would be good to have an inventory to have a searchable kind of something where you say all right i i'm interested in this this is uh i, I get the gist of it i cannot become an expert in it and my students don't want me to be an expert or spend too much time on it but if i can get some of the short video resources here that would fit it that can be classified that way that then you'd be willing to adopt this is this sort of somewhat of an accurate representation jyoti and and maybe others i think devin and and, and ian you were mentioning that as well david you were mentioning an inventory of sorts so we do have many of those outlets in the Jesuit network and beyond. And I'm sure some of them can be created or some of them uh, can exist in, in, in multiple domains. And um, so from Kimberly, I know, and you, you didn't quite mention it, but Ben, we've made a, an outline and we'll have another conversation with you specifically about the leadership course, the, the, the communication course and the management course and how some of the areas that I think can fit quite quite clearly directly um, can be developed a little bit further because the the depth that is required for example to explore motivation I think Devin you mentioned you made a very good case how your motivation shifted <laughs> right and how you tapped into a deeper level of of uh, motivation when when taking on this story or this perspective um, that that is something that I think can be powerful to teach students that's part of what we do in management. And then beyond all all kinds of, of uh, other conversations in terms of being connected in teams, it's so simple. And David, some of the stuff that we see that is working is because we're now able to be more specific about why it is working. And I think oftentimes it's the labeling uh, that was missing and people were doing intuitively, but then going back, it's like, I don't know why it worked. It just worked. So it's magic. But if we can put the CDPs in there, if we can put the 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 uh, notion of the connectedness, the fundamental connectedness, the noosphere as a common project, et cetera, into the conversation, I think it can strengthen the whole uh, existing content on, on top of what we already do. Uh, so I just wanted to sort of summarize what I heard there, that there is uh, already courses where this can be adopted. There are courses where we would want to adopt and, and, and fine grain a little bit some of the, the material and develop some more. And others are sort of like a little bit more soaking in terms of identifying <clears throat> where and how this could be developed further. Is that accurate? Okay, super. All right, so then maybe we'll talk about next steps. And Devin, do you want to comment? Is <clears throat> while everyone's thinking about how to use these resources to apply to their particular courses or or pedagogical approach in general is the, our media strategy for each one of these videos is so that they can, they're modular, so that they can stand alone by themselves and so that they can be inserted, but also they're open-ended enough to where they start and hopefully catalyze a meaningful conversation that can be furthered by another video or by some other lecture or presentation that, that supports it or takes it further down the direction. And if you um, <clears throat> look at our YouTube channel, you can start to see how Though we have this entire series as a whole, we're having sub playlists for the different um, stages of humanity that we're focusing on, for the different noosphere conditions that we're focusing on. And that might be able to spark some inspiration of, you know, these other supplemental videos that we'll be making specifically for education. We'll make playlists and we can make private playlists for you and your courses that basically takes your selections, puts it into a singular hyperlink that then you can share with your students. So. Our whole media strategy is designed to be very responsive to this, I think, very appropriate need to be to pick and choose what's um, what's resonant with both you and, and the community that you're teaching. 
So. If I could add something uh, to that, I find myself thinking that uh, you're creating this great series of videos uh, and um, in addition to which we could assemble, as you just said, but in addition to that, and especially after you complete that series, it would be lovely to have a service of doing short videos like that on demand. Um, and uh, where you would basically, someone would come to you and uh, say, I'd really love to do a, a, a video on this, which might not be exactly like what you already uh, uh, created. And uh, for example, uh, as I was stepping through the material of the course, I found uh, Ellen's material was wonderful. I loved it. Uh, but of course, it was in sort of academic mode. It was lecture, PowerPoint uh, delivered that way and so on. But uh, some of that content, which was already part of the course, if it could be artified, um, then uh, that would give the kind of zest that, uh, that uh, Jody was um, was talking about. In my case, uh, you know, there's a really need for a, a module on multi-level selection, uh, also a module on something called Tinbergen's Four Questions, if you, you might not know what that is, but it's an important module. Um, and so if that's not already part of the plan for what you're doing, then please, I'd, I'd like to get in line to use your uh, artistic capabilities to create an awesome five minute video on, on that. And then, uh, so I think that would be a lovely thing to be able to do in addition to the series that you've already already planned. It's That's the exact vision that we have for the YouTube channel is to set a foundation with the, the story of the Noosphere series that is, that is substantial, coherent, that's a platform on which we can build topical res videos that are topical responses to specific educational needs or moments that happen. You know, there could be something that happens tomorrow mm -hmm. that we need to, that that would be helpful for us to respond to in some way. So we are setting up our media department in such a way that it will be responsive to uh, individuals needs. And hopefully that's actually thinking about working with you or anybody here that actually is the fabric of us building this community in a, in a noosphere kind of way is co-creating those videos is actually an end in itself um, because then we are creating these vessels, these digital spaces in which people can enter and have the experience in a more um, direct and efficient manner uh, that really uh, stirs the spirit, but also stimulates the mind. So yes, David, uh, and the good news is the line's not super long right now. It might get long soon. <laughs> so. Devin, watch out. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. But well, I'm always thinking in a five, 10 years. Okay. But yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. But you know what, Devin, I am excited that uh, you've ignited uh, the imagination and the interest in the group here and uh, what we've created so far <clears throat> in these modules. Um, and you're behind it all. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited about it. Although I have to tell the group that uh, the demand is 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 really huge and we'll, we'll try to continue to to expand it no question the good news is that there are there are at least dozens of individuals like me that are uh you know media producers in the artistic space but also have the intellectual capacity to work with and represent these ideas. So we, you know, the people are out there. If I ever become a bottle, and I am a bottleneck on that, that there are more people that we can bring into our community to be able to, and you can imagine what that would look like of being able to work with contemplatives, thinkers, thought leaders, and pair those with media producers in a way that effectively creates these videos. And then they're all organized and presented in a modular but coherent fashion on the human energy channel. It's all, you know, it's all capable. We don't have to invent something new to accomplish that. It's just a matter of organization, prioritization, and budgeting. So wonderful. Uh, what I'm hearing in terms of next steps, I'm hearing one thing that, that David said, maybe to have a convergent type of a sprint group. Uh, I'm just throwing this in there, where some of the folks on this in this conversation are all plus a number of others would come together and see what are next potential outcomes in terms of developing that material that might be missing. Um, where Devin, I think you're sort of volunteering, so to speak, maybe to, to build on a potential 
community of folks that can help develop additional material. So that that would be new videos potentially as next steps or a conversation about what's what's missing to to intensify the conversation. Um, and I heard a number of of points uh, in terms of David, you were mentioning maybe Ellen's lectures could be artified. <laughs> Uh, Jyoti, you mentioned some of the story of Tailhard as a video, maybe a story of Devon or many Devons uh, condensed into a video. Um, and then I hear playlists and a way to manage the various pieces that are out there already. Jyoti, you were mentioning that much of the material indeed that exists can be put into this context. So maybe I think, David, you mentioned this last time in terms of a wiki or something else. That's, I'm just listening to that, and I probably forgot some of that. Um, what what you mentioned, um, Jyoti, you want you had your hand up. You want to add to that? Well, anybody else as next steps? What do you see? Um, so this is in the spirit of improv. Um, at the beginning of the meeting, I was unclear on the purpose in terms of, you know, here's a course that we have all shared and gone through and we give feedback to improve it but as it has evolved and the discussions have gone part of me is saying that's one course yes there are many different ways we can do the beta version of that but part of me is also saying each one of us can develop a course like that pretty easily for the domains that we teach in and when do we get to that? Because for me, that alpha is far more exciting to do because I already have done a lot of the work on that. And it's a matter of putting it in that consistent format of making it a resource under this umbrella as opposed to under an MSR or humanistic management or some other, since coalitions exist between them anyway, informally, since I go between those spaces, so that's the question I want to just speak into this space. Just so that I'm sure that I'm hearing it, you're saying like, what would a upgraded beta alpha, I don't know what the nomenclature is of this existing course be that we just all went through? No, that's one, but that just like Devin, that can be mm -hmm. become a bottleneck. And mm -hmm. I'm not volunteering to do a course like Ellen did, but almost thinking about that. I don't know where I will find the bandwidth to, but I want to. Wonderful. Okay, so I hear new course development. <laughs> awesome. And, and and Ben, I'm just write, writing down what I'm hearing here. This I clearly, <laughs> maybe you hear something else, Ben uh, K or Ellen or Devin or, or anybody. Uh, what, what, what else do you see? I sort of heard a potential wish for an in-person uh, space for with walks, <laughs> coffee, coffee drinking, personal conversation ability. Uh, so that may be another next step to think about. I just wanted to throw out that what we had initially also thought about is to develop a kind of a MOOC um, built on this that would be part of a uh, Coursera or or something else. Um, and so that's that's something that we've been thinking about. Kimberly and I were talking about developing video material for the specific courses. That's what, what we had talked about. I think, Ellen, you're going to do your revisions for your course. Is that correct? Or, or adapted for another course? You want to share? Um, yeah, so I'll be teaching the rhetoric and public discourse uh, again next spring. And so I'll be doing some revisions for that. And I think my next um, upper division elective course that I get to teach is probably gonna be a rhetoric of science class where these things would come in very directly. Awesome, awesome. And Ben T, I think you said in the, in the chat whether you are allowed to use any of the material. I think Ben K, that is for you to say, but I believe that is the spirit of this, that you can use it or that it's almost like, uh, a request that you use it. <laughs> so uh, no permission needed. Uh, ben K. Uh, I I just uh, you know 
I'm, I'm not an educator, obviously, uh, you guys know, but uh, Michael, you influenced me when, when we started talking about developing the course. You influenced me and impressed me with your idea. Hey, we don't want to develop a full course, but we want to develop our, uh, a module that can be incorporated into an existing course. I'm, I'm, I'm just reiterating what I understood from you. So you correct me. And I'm not too sure that I heard that concept uh, understood among the group. In other words, um, I, I heard a lot about developing another course and this and that, but, but the, the concept of, of this particular course that, that we've circulated is basically we have a block one and, and block two that fit, to, fit into an existing course. And, and the existing course would need to be maybe sometimes recreated uh, to, to take into consideration the concept of the noosphere. But what we are bringing to the table are, are the, the first two modules of, uh, of an existing uh, course or, or a course to be developed that would fit with your own teaching. But Michael, maybe you can expand on that or, or clarify that concept. So, I mean, I, I am not sure if I heard correctly, but I heard a couple of things. I did hear some of the course content as in the third story or so, something like that could be used as is. For example, Ben, you could take it on or some of the other uh, conversations and, and some of the videos. I heard that Jyoti, I think you you said building of the notice nose here. That video in itself would be something you could you could take on. So for me, that's modular pieces. That is uh, elements of something of the whole course where people can pick and choose and say this is workable. I I hear also Jyoti was saying and maybe Ellen was saying for some upper level courses or newly developed courses, they could be much more centrally focused and developed around this notion that is a to be developed. Right, that's for new courses. For co of course, that can work. And where I think where we are mostly is, from what I'm hearing, Ben T. Kimberly saying we have courses that we can't totally shift. Jyoti was also saying that we have these requirements with the learning outcomes, so we have to have certain material in there, and bits and pieces can be put together or put in that context. So what Kimberly and I did was look for modules that aren't yet developed that would fit and could be then amplified through other people taking them up. So I see a both and develop new courses that would fit as upper level electives like Ellen was saying or, or Jyoti was saying, maybe she, she, will, she is inspired to do that. That is a full course development. And then there is something where we can take existing pieces, modules into existing courses and then there is modules that don't exist yet for existing courses. So almost like a three-step there. Ben, is that, oh, is, is, is that mis a misunderstanding or mischaracterization from what the conversation was? Kimberly, Doty, Ben. Just want to add that yeah. there are a bunch of new schools that are coming up that are explicitly focused on the new story of business. And they are already developing material and have material, their very foundation. They've been around maybe in the last 10 years uh, because this paradigm of the dominant capitalistic model has been questioned. And those schools will be a very good alignment and they don't have the same hassles as the AACSV accredited ones where the institutional change becomes harder the more layers there are to it. And the new ones are just breaking out and doing it. Just as you mentioned Coursera and edX, that's in the private sector, but there are also in the within the educational sector, new schools in Japan, in India. Um, Ubiquity, that, Ubiquity is one, which is a, a wonderful development. I, I agree totally, uh, Jody. So, so I'm, uh, I'm trying to summarize a little bit these various opportunities here as I see them. And, and I think Ben, if, if, correct me if, if you don't hear that, but there's existing modules that can be adopted right away. And I think we have Ben commit to some, Kimberly, Jyoti, myself, 
and Elena already did that for her course. Then we have a conversation to be had uh, with at least the course, the, the rhetoric course that um, the, uh, the communication course that Kimberly does, or the two and Jyoti's strategy and innovation courses. And then those can be specified in terms of like what new models might be helpful for existing courses. And then, then there's the conversation around new courses, new course development, part of the conversation that we have here in terms of developing what we have already into a higher level version that could be part of a Coursera course. But then also Jyoti is saying, taking on like Ellen did that for hers, she can take that on for her course. So that's, that's three potential next steps. I think the fourth next step, or maybe the step zero <laughs> is to identify other venues and uh, formats and maybe the sprint group model of David uh, that David suggested would be a good one where we can continue this conversation for a short amount, not a short amount of time, but a determined amount of time with a very clear outcome and then identify which of these pieces could be uh, taken on going further. And yeah, I heard sort of some, some sub steps there, the inventory creation playlists, um etc cetera, etc cetera. there may be something else as well it's 11 59 on the east coast we said we would stop at 12 meaning 9 a 9 a.m but am i misrepresenting anything here what did i miss in terms of next steps okay wonderful well i want to thank you all for making the time taking the time being in this conversation. And I, I think time flew by quite frankly. <laughs> and I think there's a lot of uh, uh, spirit and energy, human energy present, even though we're electronically um, present. So I thank you all. I thank you, Ben, it's now 12 midnight. <laughs> thank it you is. for your staying power. Thank you for I'm your- I'm turning into a pumpkin. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for for the rising power on the West Coast. <laughs> and thanks to everyone else for your energy. And and Ben, if you want to stay on, we can we can just do a quick debrief. But thank you, Kimberly. Thank you, Ian. Thank you, David. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, David. Thank, Thank, you. Well, Thank you, Michael. Right. Okay. Have a great day. Have a great day. Bye. And and uh, Ellen, if if you're available, maybe you can join me with Michael just to have this discussion. But David? Sure. Bye. Bye. Is David frozen or is...